go in and get cozy. Shalom to the tribe. Drop Nation, where you at? We've been patiently waiting. We've been waiting on this moment, man, that we can just sign up, qualm up, kum shabbata. And I know that we reached that moment. <laughs> we here now. If you made it this far, congratulations to the con. Because we already won. This is a victory lap. Tribing up is simple. It's the vibration that puts you in order. And it's order over chaos every single time. Tribing up is easy. When you want it. You got to want it more than, you know, you want to be cool. You got to want it more than you want to be smart. You got to want to try, but, you know, more than you want to prove yourself. To try, but means to be in order. And that starts with putting Hawa first with no hijacks allowed. Because this is Drop Nation. And we are the hijacked slaves. It is tribe or it's nothing, man. And to accomplish that, you got to accomplish order over chaos. So the water can continue for the calm. You think you're here for information? I say you're here for vibration. A hop to the cons. Congratulations. Congrats. <laughs> we won, man. Natural by law. What it do? CJ Battle, where you at? Shabbata. We here now. So y'all get cozy. Enjoy the ride. Enjoy the water. Cause Drop Nation got the water. Allow 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 You came here for information. Get on out, man. Slide through the back door. We over here for vibration. Order over chaos every time. We here for vibration. So let's get it. Oh man. A hop to Hawa Stu, man. A hop to J Stu and the crew. <laughs> Shalom to the breads, man. Shalom to my aquas, man. Enjoy, man. This how 
Hawauda, man, nine minutes Zana, man. Keep on enjoying it. It's right there on the website for you. Matter of fact, we're just going to keep the water flowing, man. We're just going to keep the water flowing, man. <laughs> Y'all get that water, because Drop Nation got that water, man. A lot of water. All right. <laughs> All right, man. Special treat, man. Let's go ahead and get to the balcony. I want to start with this because, uh, you know, this is going to bring us right into this document that we're going to read through today. You know, hopefully we get through all or most of it, you know what I mean? And uh, if not, at least I led you to the water. At least you got the drop. La Hua. And this is where we've been dropping since 2016. We'll, we're also going to get some good, uh, great information, man, by the bro, Big Judah. Make sure you're in that classroom, you know what I'm saying? And um, so much connectivity is going on with the bro. And I'm here for it, man. I'm here for it, man. I appreciate it. You know what I'm saying? So, you know... It feels like old times, man, you know, really to be able to uh, have an investigation and be on the same page, you know what I'm saying? Or at least, you know, crossing those same lines, you know what I'm saying, together. And I appreciate the work of Big Judah, man. So go get it, man. Go get in the classroom of Caramayo, man. We're going to do a whole Caramayo feature, man, a whole nother time. We're just going to sit back in the classroom of Caramayo, Cootie Mayo, <laughs> and surf the wave with my bro that's been having our back, man. Um you know, back, front, side to side, man, surfing the wave, you know what I'm saying? So love to cootie, man, oh, man, my bro. And uh, get that uh, Project Blue, man. We're going to do a drop track. Uh, We're we going to drop the track right here. Matter of fact, man, hold up, man. Hold up, man. <laughs> you know me, man. Y'all know me. You, you know I'll be surfing the wave, right? You know we be surfing the wave, right, man? Hold up, man. Hold up, man. Hold up, man. Let's do it like this, man. We're going to uh, do a nice uh, drop feature presentation right now, man. Even though I was going to plan it later, I was going to do a slideshow. But the bro, Cootie Mayo, the bro, Nine Spiral, you know what I mean? The bro, Yosef the Real, get in that classroom, man. I can't wait to fall back and enjoy a nice feature of that, man. We're going to start doing that more and more. We just... This is a victory lap, man. You know, we're just getting started. Don't mind us. We're about to get young Drizzle off the balcony, but, you know what I'm saying, hawa, hawa, you know, put it on my mind, bone. You know what I'm saying, to check in with this Cootie Mayo. I think he got his, I think he got it on the SoundCloud. Man. Do I got the Cootie Mayo SoundCloud, man? Matter of fact, this might be much easier, man. Let me just pull up his SoundCloud. Go get in this. I'm going to drop this link, the Cootie Mayo SoundCloud. Beautiful thing. He got a great drop called Crossbones with Joseph Nine Spiral. This joint is crazy, you know what I'm saying? Let's see, I'm on the homepage here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, this is Cutter Mayo, Cooter Mayo's homepage, man. Right, we're going to pop off with this crossbones. We're going to follow it up with this Project Blue, man. Fall back, man. We surfing the wave, man. Drop feature. Presentation. Let go. Spiral man be going in hard man. Shout out to Yo Scepter Real man. We got we got some strudels popping out the oven man. Crossbones man. Mm. 
Cozy man, y'all getting cozy man. What it do, man? Everybody in the chat, chat, chatter. Look, the solution. Too much in the hijack, spiritual pollution. I see the hidden layers with programming confusion. Media propaganda, spitting poison, the plan and execution. Corona takes the blame for this radiation distribution. Bill Gates, pedophile, demonic institutions. New world order bring artificial resolutions. They want to depopulate, vaccinate with a chip, the foregone conclusion. In the news, numbers die, but the studies are improving. The sheep follow and believe. But these cons you ain't fooling Tribing up with Awa as the guy we be moving Before our eyes prophecy manifests and reviewing Time to rise like the sun we ain't losing Kwam the Sharala, the kingdom come, you'll be ruined This time has come and most high is recruiting Have no fear, these devils we refuting Cause they got no power, so be careful what power you are choosing And when the time comes, we'll see who's ready to ride Trust my arrows, I'll be shooting Shout out to Yosef, Nine Spiral, Cootie Mail, man. We just having an impromptu drop feature presentation session. And I'm going to drop this new Project Blue, man, that I am uh, truly Baruch, man, to surf the wave with the bro Yosef and Nine Spiral and Cootie Mail. You know what I mean? Great drop. And uh, we will, you know what I'm saying, drop it on our site. We're doing the whole thing, update, so you can, you know, go get the drop there, download, man. Just enjoy the flow and support this SoundCloud. It's popping off with Cordy Mayo, Alego, Project Blue, man. Let's pop this one off right quick. Hold on, man. I got some, I got, you, you got advertisements on site, man. If you don't get out of here with these ads, man. And they hold you hostage too. Chasing down that one oh person. man, they hold you hostage with their advertisement, man. Oh, we got twelve more seconds. But look, man, I got ten seconds just to say it's always an honor to rock with the tribe. You know what I'm saying? So if you got some tracks, you know, hit us up. Music at four three two to drop dot com. We about to get to all this drop. Don't even trip. We just having a nice vibration session drop feature presentation. <laughs> Oh, you for being no witness. 
is creating mad deception, so blatant that it provides to sit back and watch and partake in this agenda to separate a people from destiny that's awaiting. Don't want your forgiveness because judgment is unabated. No future is striving with your maker acting according to that which you see on this earth that's congregated. Come out and be separate, these heathens have been conforming. The price is going up and directly to the inflation. A new paradigm is beginning, sounding alarming. No fear, not an option. I beseech you to keep vibrating, refuting oppression and diluting that which is evil. One day and one sound, keep this power of resonating and spread across the earth because it belongs to the people. A coronation, that's me in self preservation. Say, Lincoln, free slaves, but Sam Cole, the made us equal. For real, let go. of death suppressed by the smoke of the zest i feel it in my flesh hustle till i rest i'm stressed but every day blessed amongst devils doing my best it's hard but how wild my guide my bullet profess so i write if i have to don't test our leaders possessed world oppressed fool they're ruled by a family crest priests that molest our children depressed wolves like sheep dressed so i'm here to invest fists in the air anarchy civil unrest got the knowledge damage success drop nation we the best third eye open we slaying these pests covert planetary conquest behind the scenes like they don't exist, I resist, no fear of my quest, know thyself, G.O.D. in the physical express, my words burn your chest, your heart collapse, cardiac arrest, spiritual protest, freedom we manifest, they owe us, I'm collecting our debts, taking mine and free the masses with no regrets, cause maybe united we can progress, the second coming manifest, oh, wow. that's fresh, next year's the year of the rap, staring at the judge like how you know that, they ask your boy to cop a plea, I say I'll be right back, staring at that like F, I know it's a trap. It's a cold ass hustle. Shit. It's a cold ass hustle. All bite, no muscle. You think you got the puzzle? Next wave, blue struggle. We right. pump iron for the muscle. Iron Mike in the scuffs. Yeah. Only thing about the wood is they ain't Try trying to tussle. Nah. Got hot blooded knockers in the mix of them jungles. You know. And harsher men are armored. Word to my cousin. You know. Rest right. of the power nip. I'm telling you what he does know. That his tribe was nuts. Otherwise, we done for. Back. Staring down the road like, damn, I wish that I'd done more. Cold place to be, but not as cold as his jail flow. 20 hour lockdown and they closing our stores down. Small price to pay for putting boots on a pedophile. CO's playing game, they put him here with a big smile. Know a damn well, no hijacks allowed. You feel me? Project Blue or Blue Beam. Niggas blow, we cop beams. Niggas blow, we get kings and queens ready to reign. The show far scenes, Elijah brings. Restoration we need. It's going out to the seas. Behind the wall, you are free. No, though. Shout out to Carter Mayo, man. Project Blue, all the you, man. Love to the bros, man. Love to the ox. I know I got a lot of heavy spitters, man, in the tribe. You know what I'm saying? So it's just only right, you know what I mean, that we keep the vibe going, you know, for the tribal flow, man. You know what I mean? For the for the bass drum, man. We got to keep the bass drum flowing, man. You know what I mean? The heart bone. And this is a lot of fun, man. Check out that Frequency Wars. I mean, all these drops, man. Kuri Mayo, man, been doing it for a minute. With Drakans, Cry, Papu Va. I mean, it's a great thing, man. Kuri Mayo got the drop. And we're just surfing the way. Hey, man, y'all want to start in this Manasseh in Israel? Let's, let's start right here. Pull up this link. Let's go. Manasseh Ben Israel and his world. And then, you know, we're going to pull it all together. You know, we're going to see where we're, see where it takes us because Colombo, Columbus is saying he's coming to America to seize the holy city. That's the mission of Colombo. If he's looking, I mean, let's just jump right into it right quick. Let's just jump right into it right quick. Then I'm going to come back to this Manasseh. I just want to jump right in. And hopefully you got this drop. I've, <laughs> hey, Drop Nation, you show up, man. When I say email me for the link, I've been returning hundreds of emails all day. 
because I want to make sure you get the drop when you want the drop and you got the drop, whether it's that thousand dollar book, whether it's this drop that it took us years to refine this link. But all praise of why it came up at the right time. And, you know, Big Judah alluded to that as well, man, that, you know, saying Hawaii's bringing this out at the right time. So let's just pick it up from here in page three. You know, this is what we got on that quick clip. And we're going to break it down, you know, and go back to the top and then go back through. You know, so don't even trip. We're chilling. We live. It's all good. It's all happening. Let's go. Now, we almost broke the Internet, man. You know, say when we dropped this drop in 2016 and with a dragonfly perspective, it's even clearer. We're going to read it nice and slow again, right? Among the earliest and most fascinating witnesses to the latter is a manuscript of 84 pages, 84 folios dated between September 13, 1501, March 23rd, 1502, and now preserved in the Biblioteca Columbina in Sevilla. It begins, this is the beginning of the book or collection of autoritates. Sayings, opinions, and prophecies concerning the need to recover the holy city. So just back up to stop right there. This means that Colombo is fascinated with the holy city. Right? Don't tell us he's doing anything else important other than discovering the holy city. Discovery and conversions of the islands of the Indies is synonymous with the Holy City. Because you can't be on two different missions at the same damn time. Every time he sets sail, he's coming this way. He's looking for India Superior, Grand Tartary. He's looking for Preston John, the Grand Khan. I mean, can we put it together? I'm just surfing the wave, man. Don't mind me. I mean, look, by Naga, everybody looking for the priest king. Everybody looking for him. Where do you think Columbus fits in in this picture? I mean, let's really take it slow here, and let's really do this for the tribe. The tribe that wants to be here at this moment, surfing the wave. This ain't no small feat that you put all these distractions aside, no matter what brought you here, because of your love for the drop or your your inner disdain for the drop. It got you here. Why? What's your purpose, man? What's their purpose? I mean, 1145 to 1645. Meditate on it. And you tell me where Columbus fits in in this picture. It looks like he's hitting dead damn smack, dead smack in the midst of this Preston John search. And if Columbus is what sparked off the Crusades, I mean, we got that out of what? We on 55? We on Preston John 55? I mean, for real, for real? So if we know that the search for this black man, you know what I mean? And, you know, I, I ain't gonna get too much into the Preston John investigation right now, but you have to see that it's all synonymous, my nag. It's all the same damn thing. We are just Baruch, man. We, we just got that Baruch from Hawaii that we can notice this thing from different angles. We can notice this invasion. We can, you know, uh, uncover and journey into a road less traveled Although they've all been searching for. But our journey to get there in relation to Colombo and the more on more war that's happening here. Is an unfamiliar road. It was paved just for us, man, just for you and me. So that we can see this Colombo situation and fit it into our search. Fit it into our investigation. 
Let's go back. Let's go back. Matter of fact. I always got to pull this thing up brand new, man. I swear I bookmarked this thing a million. I got to start printing more stuff out, tell you the truth, man. I think we all do. I think we all do. Atlantic Monthly Journal, man. Some of y'all, my wave servers already know what I'm looking for. I'm just going to have to try to spell this thing out, man. Columbus, Cuba, Grand Con. Volume 104. Well, let go. Sometimes you got to spell it out. Sometimes you got to know what you're looking for. A drop nation. How does Columbus fit into this picture so we can go back into this drop and overstand what we're dealing now, what we're dealing on and what we're digging in, what we're digging, dealing with, <laughs> digging on, dealing with, and digging <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, Columbus, man, is a... Uh, It's a mind blasting thing, especially when you factor in <laughs> up to the fam especially when you factor in the actual. We're gonna have to sit back and just dig on this whole like documentary here or whatever this is. I gotta I still gotta watch this thing. <laughs> hey man, we're just talking Columbo, man. <laughs> And how does it connect to these rebels, these Negro rebels in Brazil, right? We're talking Zumba. We're talking Zumbi. We will be getting back. We're just talking Priest Kings. We're just talking Presters, Khan. And they're searching for Colombo. They're searching for Atlantic Monthly Journal, Wave Surface, what they do. Let's go. Let's go. Again, in the Cariba, this is out the Atlantic Monthly Journal, Volume 104. Let's go. And again, in the Kariba and Kaniba, which is described to him as the mainland behind Hispaniola, in our language, the north coast of South America, Columbus believes he has at last located the name and kingdom of the Khan. Stop. 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 Because someone... uh. You know, everybody was very, uh, you know, appreciative. One person hit me back and said, you know what? I, you know, looking at this document here, uh, it doesn't exactly prove beyond a shadow of a doubt. It doesn't exactly prove beyond a reasonable doubt drop <laughs> that the holy city is in America. I mean, you know, he just had the motive to see, find the holy city, but... Oh, man. Damn. Damn, damn. <laughs> yeah, man, you know, you got to really bury standards to static when you, uh, you know, are surfing the wave, you know. This is the beginning of the book or collection of authorities, right? Authorities, sayings, opinions, and prophecies concerning the need to recover the holy city and Mount Zion and discovery, conversion. We're going to read about some of this conversion in Manasseh and Israel of the islands of the Indies of all our peoples and nations for their people. All right, so you're telling me that this manifesto here to correlate with the hindsight that we know of, of what Columbus did and didn't do. What other business did Columbus have other than jamming us up? You know what I'm saying? I mean, whatever he must have done other than come over here and jam us up was very insignificant. His whole shit is around this. I mean, don't even let us get into the St. Christopher. Don't let us get into shepherd syphilis and the dog-headed sign of folly. I mean, that's, that's when we're really going into... <laughs> crystal ball you know what i'm saying the dog had it 
But right now, I'm playing nice. I'm playing nice with these people. We playing nice with y'all. You know why? Because it's a victory lap. And, you know, when it's time to, uh, you know, make you the footstool, it's going to happen in real time. So, you know, it's a victory lap. Columbus is saying, remember, this is com- this is compiled by Columbus himself. This is the beginning of the book. So it's going to be a whole collection, right? We're going to get into what this collection really symbolizes in a minute. Sayings, opinions, prophecies concerning the need to recover the holy city of Mount Zion. That, that ain't got nothing to do with America. If it was just about going, you know, down the block, you know what I'm saying, in the other world, if it was just about going, you know what I'm saying, from Spain to the so-called Middle East, I don't think it would have been much of a, you know, big voyage, you know, situation. You know what I mean? You would, you would have traveled through the Mediterranean situation or you would have taken whatever route, the same damn thing. You were charged up to find this holy city in Mount Zion, Colombo. To recover, to seize, and the discovery and conversion of the islands and Indies. The reason why this comes after a comma is because it has everything to do with Mount Zion and the Holy City. The discovery and the conversion, forced conversion of my Nagas right here in the Indies, the Indias, the Third India. Or the Grand India has everything to do with the Holy City. You can't separate the Holy City from the Indies. This is why this document is so doggone important because we got it right here in one condensed little excerpt from Columbus, compiled by Christopher Columbus himself <laughs> in collaboration with Gorishio. And what did he write to Gorishio about the situation? Okay. I began to collect in a book excerpts from authoritative sources that seem to me to refer to Jerusalem. And we're gonna get the whole thing when he talks about Granada. And, you know, we already know Palma Granada, right? Palma Granada, yeah, Calalus, right? What's this Grand Canyon about? Matter of fact, what's the Grand Khan about? Because he's talking about Jerusalem, man. Columbus is over here tripping. Columbus is over here tripping. He's talking about Jerusalem. He's over here tripping. Can I get this any bigger, man? Let's go. Let's go. I'm charged up right now, man. You know what I mean? It's just that time to be charged up right now. You can't be wishy-washy. You know what I mean? You got to be 100% you and your purpose and your shoes or nothing else. Get out of my way. Get out of everybody's way if you ain't 100% you. You trying to be anybody else. <laughs> if you trying to act any type of other way, you're going to lose, man, because you ain't you. But maybe you saw a glimpse of you. Maybe there was a you at one point that you need to reconnect to and remember what got you here. Remember who you are. Reconnect to Hawaii. Again, in the Kariba Kaniba. All right, this Kariba described as the north coast of South America. Columbus believes he has at last located Presta John. The Grand Khan. Remember, by this time, shit, you could be talking about Genghis Khan's folks too, right? Because this this war supposedly happened about a couple hundred years earlier than this. So is you looking for Preston John? Is you looking for whoever got the Khan now? Whoever got the Khan is who got the priesthood. And this is why he brought a Hebrew interpreter to meet you, my nugget. Columbus brought a Hebrew interpreter to meet you when he recovered the what? The holy city and Mount Zion.
All right, so when he's talking about recovering the holy city of Mount Zion, he brought a Hebrew interpreter, Louis Torres, a convert that we got out the Lost Tribes and Promised Lands by Ronald Sanders, a convert to speak Hebrew to the people right here, man. We're talking Ofer, right? Christ Ofer, Christ of Ofer. He's the anointed. Columbus is the Christ. He granted them new life, man. He gave them new life. We're talking millenarians, man. I can say it with me. Millenarians. What's a millenarian? They thought the world was ending in the 1600s. Some would say 1666 to be exact. Thought the world was in it. So what did it mean to find Preston John or the land? It wasn't just about finding this black king. It was about finding the wealth, right? About the, it's about the takeover, about the military takeover of King David. It's about the military takeover of the Khan. At this point, even Genghis Khan was about to go down based on this particular structure they was coming with, right? After the Papal Bull doom diverses, wasn't nobody safe, right? All Saracens gotta go. This is a this is a renaissance, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So someone else is coming into power, right? The Khans are coming out of power, and then the Cohens are coming into power. Khan. So what holy city? What Mount Zion, man? Let's go. Because we're talking about the Biblioteca Columbina in what? Seville, right? There's a printed copy of the Polo Record, the Libra Divasorum or Libra des Diversities of Messer Marco Milioni, which belonged to Cologne. And in this, there are manuscript notes by Christopher Christ of Ophir. Are we talking Haiti? Are we talking Philippines? What are we talking? Himself on 76 of the 150 pages showing how well he knew and how much he valued the book, which perhaps more than any other was his God. All right. Even if Polo's name does not occur in Admiral, the Admiral's Journal of the Voyage of 1492. And again, is Marco Polo the Paul, the Polo of the New Testament? Huh? <laughs> Explorers, you know, all right, with the con. Huh? Okay, I mean, that's love to tie battle, though. That's love to tie battle. <laughs> what it do, Aqua? So check it. Even if Polo's name does not occur in the Admiral's Journey Journal of the Voyage of 1492, or rather in the abstract of that journal, which is all that we possess, yet Polo's Cathay and Zapangu are constantly in evidence herein. Constantly in evidence herein. What's in evidence? Polo's Cathay and Zapongo. Right. Cathay. Polo's Cathay. Remember, Cathay means a pure land. And Zapongo is just Japan. <laughs> I mean, you've seen the maps. We pulled them up. So when we speak Cathay, we're also talking Cateo, India Superior, La China, La Florida, New World, right? No, 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 no. It seems like our world was at some point reflected over there. Like everything else is, man. Let's go. A week before he lands in Guanahani, Columbus opinions that the Penzan suggestion to steer southeast is not made with respect to Capongo. Two days after the discovery, he feels he must go to try and find Capongo. <laughs> and when he reaches Cuba, right? So is Japan or Zapongo or Capongo just Cuba? which uh, in some languages was Hawa Hawa. From the signs the Indians made 
to be this very land. So he knows when he reaches this Japan Kapongo, he knows he's in Cuba, man. At the same time, he is actually anxious to reach the mainland of China. He wants to reach the mainland of La China. Huh? <laughs> is the picture getting clearer or what? I mean, this is 15, 1548. You're talking about millenarians that think the world is ending in 1666. And I'm asking you, who is Preston John? And why did they stop searching in 1645? Their prophecy was that they're going to find these Hebrews. And that is going to give them new life. They're going to find these Jews. And they're going to get new life by finding the Israelites. They get new life or they die. That's the, you know, proposition. That's the situation they're in, in Europe, the black plague, whatever you call it, the, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the tenderoni over there, you know what I mean? Whatever you call it, they weren't living past 35, you know what I'm saying? So they needed life. They had a, they were declining in population, man. Who declines in population consistently? They decline when left alone, the virus dies. Huh? When left alone, the virus dies. So it needed something to eat off of. And this is what this millenarian situation you're about to get is all about, man. So 1645, they stopped looking, huh? They stopped looking for El Presta John, right? Look out for Presta John of 55, a Lego. Check it. At the same time, he is equally anxious to reach the mainland of China. He is determined to deliver the letters of the Catholic kings to the Grand Khan. Khan? Come on, man. I mean, just type in Wong Khan, press the job. I'm not even going to look. You click on it, man. Matter of fact, let's click on it. Let's just go. Wikipedia, let's go. Nothing but space and opportunity over here. Ta Guru was another title for the same presbyter at the same time. Now, he's died, they say, 1203 after this fight with Genghis Khan. Or, you know, did he... You know, bow out gracefully because it was his time to lay low. I mean, we don't know, right? But Wong Khan, because C-A-N or K-A-N or K-H-A-N, you got the same vibration. Or Onk Khan or Onk Khan was Khan of the Karyas, right? Which you get into being the Kara Katai, which they connect to Nestorianism, old king renowned from wise counsel and then you connect that with the magi and the magi are the mongol magi equals mongol oh man just for fun just for fun man. love to my uh, anonymous sister i'm trying not to get into pressure john 55 but it's just you know you know how we do when we surf the wave man we got this magi drop up here okay okay yeah i mean look when we talk Mongol, just know we're talking great, okay? Great equals Mongolian. So this is why I'm tying in the Wong Kong, Mongol, Jin Dynasty, Lao Dynasty, uh, Shi Dynasty, you know, Shi. I mean, all this is connecting Tangu. This is all Israel, man. The Russians is Israel, man. Or the and Rus. We, we've been over this. So great equals Mongol Empire. We're talking Magi. But check this out. Moguls or Mongols equals great ones. Magi, as mentioned above, are most probably the same as Mongol, man. So you keep hearing of the descendants of the Magi. You're just talking about the great ones, which is the same title as Mongol, man. We just were given a different history as a presentation of this because they knew they couldn't hide it forever. So they gave us Mongol and this whole other... You know what I'm saying? Illusion behind the Mongol, but we're just talking to what? The greats, man. 
the great ones, man. The Magi's, man. Come on, man. Tie your history together. We're talking press to child and the kingdom. Why are they looking for a man? And what has this got to do with Columbus? Searching for the Grand Khan. Especially when you're tying it in with Wong Khan. And all these Khans, man, that's connected with this or Hans. So you got to look in the Han Dynasty, my lives. Blood brother of the Mongol chief Yesugui and served as an important early patron and ally of Yesugui's son, Temujin, later known as Genghis Khan. So first they were allies. You know what I'm saying? It appears that Preston John, this, at least this particular King David, had an alliance. He was an Anda or blood brother. That doesn't mean that they are related. It just means that they have a blood oath. So he had a blood oath to protect Yesugui, who was Genghis Khan's pops, and thus to protect his son. But then his son wanted to be the Khan, and they went to war because Genghis Khan wanted to marry his daughters and different things like that. And King David said, nah, you ain't no David. Stop tripping. I took you in. I'm blood brother to your pops, but now you're tripping. And there was an issue. There was an issue with the Khans. That's why I said we got to look in the gins. Wong means king or prince, right? King or prince. 13th century Tagru was one of the several Asian leaders, right? Where's Asia? <laughs> Who was identified with the legend of Prester John, but also King David. Then they say a brother to John. His Christian name may indeed be David. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> I'm out of here, y'all. I'm out of here. I'm out of here, man. I'm out of here. I'm out of here, man. It's a victory lap. Because we're just talking Dawi. Hosea 3. We're just talking da David, man. Why are we searching? Why are they searching? But pick it up in Preston John 55. I just want to talk Columbo and why he's looking for the Grand Khan to deliver these letters. With the said Grand Khan, he gathers from the natives. A Cuban monarch was now at war. The Khans, so he's already at war, right? It's so more and more war, right? We're reading about it. They're already at war, whether we're talking 1200s here and then forget the time shifts because all this could be happening at the same time. Damn time. Or at least by the time Colombo come, I mean, he's he's marching through the residue of the war torn country. What war? Right. We got the Genghis Khan is warring against not just these Jin or Wang Kong, Kari, it's Karakatai, but against the Tangu or the Shi, which are the Almec which connect back to the Toltec. So Venus Toltecs is connect back to Solomon, Swan Knights. What romance are you in? We're talking heroes and knights. Love to the Templo. All right. Wong Kong. We're talking the Kong. So this, this really blew it out the, this really blew it away when we went back to this Atlantic Monthly uh, Volume 104. And hey, out to everybody who's, you know, listening in, digging on it. I see y'all. Appreciate y'all, man. Get cozy, man. Get cozy, man. We just getting started. We having a great time. And you, Drop Nation, are the reason why we're here. Hey, hop to the contributors for the contrib contributions, man. <laughs> we talking the grand cons, man. The grand contributions at 432 to Drop Radio. Hey, hop to everybody dropping it on the PayPal and the Cash App. Keeping the lights on and keeping the water flowing. Let go. So with the said Grand Khan, he gathers, Colombo gathers from the natives that this Cuban monarch or this Grand Khan was now at war. Right? The Khan's great ships he understood came to Cuba 10 days journey from the Chinese mainland. So he said, hell no. You ain't talking about China way over there. If it takes them months on a slave ship, we got to travel months, right, from Africa to America. How the hell are you telling me that you get into Cuba in 10 days? Unless when you talk Chinese mainland, my nag, 
We're just talking a la China. <laughs> and how can you get to Cuba? Or, you know, it's Espanol with Cuba. Around there, or is it down here? Either way, man. Either way, you know what I'm talking about. Now, this makes more sense if you want to get to the Chinese mainland, you know what I mean, from one of these islands or one of these islands, you know what I mean? That makes more sense. That's more of a 10-day situation, however you however you slice or dice this island situation. But to get to La China, China over here? Oh, come on, boss. Come on, boss. It's a body bag for the illusion. Ten days journey from the Chinese mainland. He came to Cuba ten days from China. Ten days from China, right? La China. Is that Cuba over there? I mean, all right, y'all let me know. <laughs> all right. So what, you got to go around South America to get there? What are we talking about, man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Cuba's near Florida, yeah. So it's over here, right? Yeah, yeah, all right. I ain't tripping. So yeah, how do you get there? Do you cut across the land? Do you go around? Either way, we're talking a what? 10-day journey. The cotton on the West Indies would be sure of the good market in the cities. His majesty was perhaps in the grand city of Cathay. And again, when you're talking Preston John of the Cariots, we're talking the Kara Katai. Katai is Cathay. Katai is Cathay. I mean, do we got to show you one more time? Kara Katai Cathay. And then we're going to get back into this document. I'm just having fun. I'm just having fun because you just having fun. <laughs> and we got this last time. This Cathay is China, right? But we're talking Kara Katai, right? <laughs> All right, Black Cathay, right? Yeah. And if we're talking Carl Katai, Manag. There's a good chance you're talking Yellow Dashi. Oh, yeah, you know, because when you get to China, Katai is a bad word. You're not even allowed to say Katai. It's a, you know, one of those derogatory terms when it comes to China. When you talk about the Khan of the Chin, the Khan of the Chin. Have you heard that? The Khan of the Chin. The Kara Katai used the image of China to legitimize their rule in Central Asia. Or is it the other way around? Kara Katai did not convert to Islam. Khan, Khan, Khan. So they weren't Christians. They were Muslim. Hmm. Were they Hebrew? Were they Hebrew? However, the use of the name Katai to mean China or Chinese by Turkey spe speakers within China is considered pejorative or damn, what, derogative by the Chinese authorities who tried to ban it. So you can't even say Katai, even though it means China. Why? Because it leads you right to press the John, man. To the yellow dashis, Khan. I mean, look, man. Let's go back to this link. We're talking Kar Katai. We're talking press the John, which means we're talking what? King David. We're talking the Kara. Oh, you're talking Wong Khan. Of the Kariot, all right? So the Kariot is the Kara Katai. Wong Khan, after having killed his brothers, the sons of his of his Khan's father's Kurakas Baruch, had hostilities with his uncle Gur Khan and hid in the land of Kara Um Krevis. So they was having his family beef, no matter how you slice it. What are you looking at? The uh, Davids and Daniels, or you know what I'm saying? The Daniels and the Anans and Anions, you know what I'm saying? It seems to be the same family infighting. When you're talking Israelites, you know, Joseph, his brothers, <laughs> Genghis Khan's subjects. Pitying the rough journey of hunger, he gave him 
donation out of his own his own Genghis Khan subjects harbored him in his own Kari camp and took care of him. The winter they moved together and Genghis Khan went to Kabukhaya, Kabukhaya, something like that. Now looks, he also went to the Karakatai for protection. And hid there in subjugation. He has not loved his nation but made it suffer cruelly. What do we do with them? And he goes into this whole joint on the market. Alright man. Wang Kong hearing these words of Genghis said, Alas, I have separated from my good son and shame my good state. I have split apart from my esteemed son and done a deed of disunity. <laughs> this is what Wang Kong is saying. Having spoken these words of repentance, he made an oath saying, If I ever think evil of my son Temujin, may the blood flow thus. And he pricked his fingertip with a knife, collected the blood in a small container, and sent it saying, Give this to my son. Genghis Khan then sent the following message to Jamuka. With an evil mind, you have separated me from my Khan father. Whoever rose earlier of us two would drink from the blue cup of our father, Wang Kong. I always woke up early and drank from his cup, so you must have gotten jealous. Now drink from the Khan father's blue cup as you, as much as you can. How can you empty it? I mean, look, obviously this is a real sensitive situation. You know what I'm saying? Between Genghis and Wang Kong, Preston John. You know, they had this blood oath, you know what I'm saying? Yet, you know, there was this you know, falling, you know, falling from, you know, this, this bond, you know what I mean? This, this, this bond was broken, whether it was jealousy, whether it was envy, whether it was, you know what I'm saying? You know, just the need to dominate, you know what I mean? This became the biggest war that we've never really heard of, right? We're talking Hong Kong John, who they call a Christian ruler. Okay. Check it out. Ruler of the Barbarian. Now, this is what the Inberius Hebraeus Ecclesiastical History written in the 13th century. Ong Kong John, <laughs> Christian king, ruler of the Barbarian Hun, people called Crit or Carriot. Wow. Wow. So we just talked about the Hans, but now when you talk about the Hans, <laughs> it's the same people. You see how they're using the same titles in this Mongol history. That's why we're digging through it, man. That's why we can't let it go. Took a wife from one of the Cathayan people called Karakete or Karakatai. He abandoned the faith of his fathers and worshiped strange gods. Hmm. Hmm. Well, who's saying this? <laughs> who's saying this? That Preston John abandoned the faith of his fathers and worshiped strange gods. In the travels of Marco Polo, book one, chapter 47, now in the year of Christ 1200, he sent an embassy to Preston John and desired to have his daughter to wife. Ah, let's go back for a second. So this is Wong Kong's character and primary sources. So this is different people talking about Preston John from both sides. <coughs> All right, that's what I thought. I mean, you know, anyone looking out from the, you know, outside in or whatever the case is. So now in the year of Christ 1200, they say our embassy, he sent an embassy to Preston John, desired to have his wife, his daughter to wife. But when Preston John heard that Genghis Khan demanded his daughter in marriage, he was very raw and said to the envoys, what imprudence is this to ask my daughter to wife? Whilst he not, is he not well that he was my liegeman and serf? Get you back to him and tell him that I had lever set or I would rather basically set my daughter in the fire than give her in marriage to him and that he deserves death at my hand, rebel and traitor that he is. So this is Preston John's response to Genghis Khan asking for his daughter in marriage. So, you know, I mean, you got to you got to decide, 
you know, it, it's either <laughs> uh, Hong Kong, you know, leaving the faith of his people, you know, or is he the one that you want, you know, his daughters from, you know what I'm saying? And that he deserves death at my hand. So he bade the envoys be gone at once and never come into his presence again. The envoys on receiving this reply departed straightway and made haste to their master and related all that Preston John had ordered them to say and keep nothing back. So when you talk Preston John, you talk Kara Katai. And this becomes, you know what I'm saying, the connection to Cathay. Let's see if we get this piece here. And then, and then we're ready, you know. Then we got a dragonfly perspective to go back into this, you know, Colombo dock. But again, the Presta John of this story is the emperor of the Kara Katai, the Gurkha. And then they go into this yellow dashi. And that's why we went into, you know, the same drop. It kept leading us to yellow dashi. Yellow dashi. Now, which one is he? You know what I'm saying? Again, these are titles. You know what I mean? And that's why we have, <laughs> you know, uh, stacked up 55 parts almost. You know, coming on 55 of these two-hour series, you know, known as the Preston John Investigation. Oh, man, we got to get back on the Ken, man, the Kenites. <laughs> we related them to the to the Canaanites. You remember the mark that was put over Cain and his people so that they wouldn't get hurt? The Most High was protecting Cain. And it's just still the lineage connected to the Ken. And the same Kenites, which are, which are also the Medianites, you know what I'm saying? That Reuel or Moses' father-in-law is a Kenite. Oh, man, I mean. How do these cans play, man? How do these Katai's play? And again, Katai is China. <laughs> the Katai, that's the name Marco Polo gave to China. Cathay is derived. And who is the emperor of the Cathay? All right, now we all point. Because Colombo want to talk Cathay. I'm just asking you, who's the emperor of Cathay? And that's why, you know, we pull up that map with Preston John, you know what I mean, <laughs> right over here. Which is why I can't no one tell you not to look for the drop right here in, you know, greater Asia, the old world, when you know what to look for. This is out of the mythical Straits of Anion drop. Wow. It's getting warmed up over here. The water is, you know, constantly flowing left the drop nation. I mean, can't no one tell you not to look over here, man. Another 1530 map out the British Museum, right? So let's put this all together. This is Cuba. Okay, now we're clear. <laughs> all right, Cuba. And then we had that little China, which was right around here. Ten days journey, they said. Okay, I can see that. I can see that. Oh. What we got right there, Prester John, India Superior, Cathay, Kara Katai, right? Katai is, Cathay is China. So where's China? Where's Kana, right? It's not China. It's Kana. 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 Let's go. Let's go, man. We having too much fun over here. <laughs> turn it into a press. I, I was trying not to turn this into a press, but now we can just see clearly. All right, so we're talking... Kata, Kathay, Emperor of the Kata, Wong Ka, Prestija, Ta Guru. Gotcha. We got Jamuka, which I keep saying looks a lot like Jamaica. Balego, that's Genghis Khan's best homie. 
So got everything to do with invading lands. <laughs> All right, all right. So we're talking Kari, it's Khan. All right, we got, we got, we're back. We're back. We're back. All because of this right here. <laughs> so when we look at this with a dragonfly perspective, we're talking about the Grand Khan's great ships. We're talking about Colombo, right? Looking for the Khan, right? He understands, came to Cuba, 10 days journey from the Chinese mainland. All right. His majesty was perhaps in the grand city of Cathay. All right. So we got a perspective of what Cathay is, Kara, Katai. And we can see clearly Cathay, Preston John, India Superior, North America, however you want to call it, Asia, uh, Grand Tartaria, you know what I mean? Greater Asia. Old world. Why did Columbus bring a Hebrew interpreter to speak to you here? Why is he looking for the holy city here? Because they're looking for. <laughs> they're looking. For Preston John. Looking for Preston John. So let's go. So now we have a perspective of, you know, this documentation. And uh, let's get a piece, and I'm going to get some great drop from Big Judah. And then we're going to go to uh, Balcony Surfer Drop. He got something for us. And get back into this Manasseh, Ben Israel, and his world. Matter of fact, we'll just start right here since we're here already, and then we'll read the other drop. Make sure we're good. We surfing the wave. Y'all, y'all cozy yet? It's been about an hour. Y'all good? Okay. All right. All right. Let's go. Just getting started. Manasseh in Israel and his world, edited by Yosef Copland and Richard Henry. All right. Where y'all want to get it from, man? It's, it's got a lot of drop in this, man. You know, I've been meaning to get back to it because I know it got a lot of drop. But then uh, Balcony Surfer drop reminded me to get to it. And I say, all right, right away, then Balcony Surfer, right away. Here's a good place. Although Meade carried great weights with the English Puritan, they realized that even he could be wrong. He claimed that various events in the book of Revelation would occur in 1642. Got it. Got it. Got it. They stopped looking for Preston John in 1645. According to their book of Revelation, <laughs> these events are popping off three years before they stop searching for King David, right? <laughs> and it said, and they did not, besides. The settler missionaries found matters in Massachusetts Bay Colony quite different than Meade had described. They found docile, friendly Indians, some of who wanted to become Christians. Oh, boy. I'm sure we were just lining up. I'm sure it had nothing to do with nothing forced, right? They established schools for them. They tried to get the great Jan Comenius to use Harvard as the center of universal enlightenment for Indians and the European. Wow. Y'all see this? 
They were using Harvard as the center for brainwashing Indians, missionaries. So before they gave you this glamorized, you know, version of these universities, man, these are nothing but Indian schools, yo. These are nothing but Indian schools that now we're paying and going into debt forever to go to. Wow. <laughs> How much are we paying to get into this Indian school called Harvard for universal enlightenment? Ah, uh, they translated the scriptures for the Indians, the missionaries began to suspect something radically different was going on in the environments of Boston. Namely, that the pure English Christians were baptizing and converting Indians who were Hebrews. The Indians are the Hebrews, but Jerusalem is over there. The Indians are the Hebrews, but Jerusalem is over there. <sighs> the Indians are the Hebrews and India superior, but Jerusalem is over or what here Arabia we should line up and hop on a plane to cross these beautiful seas to get over here from India superior China. Kateo. Kate, Kate, Kate. Katai. Got it, got it. Got it, boss. Got it, boss. Let's go. I mean, not really, because we are already home. But they were baptizing and converting Nagas, who are the Hebrews. And if the Indians were Hebrew, an enormous missionary effort would be needed, my nag. Because how the, how the hell can you convert a Hebrew to be a Christian? This is the big conversation right here. This is what Charles I is dedicated to solving this equation, right? Now you got the King James Version. Huh? I can't put down my King James Version, man. It has nothing to do with my conversion. Does the King James Version have anything to do with your conversion? All right. If the Indians were Jews, Hebrews, an enormous missionary effort would be needed. So on behalf of the New England Missionary Society, Hijack City, is what we call them, a volume was written by a Norfolk preacher, one Thomas Thorogood, let's go, called Jews in America, or the probability that the Indians are Jews, that the Indigenous Indians in India superior are the Hebrews. We need to find them Jews so we can get more life. So we can get to the holy city, right? Let's put it all in perspective. Dragon Flitter 360. Only a face bone. This was to be dedicated to Charles I, but his overthrow delayed the publication of the book. The job of the job of writing a preface to it was given to John Dury, perhaps the most active millenarian theoretician or theoretician, right, in the Puritan Revolution. So here comes this terminology, millenarian. I asked you earlier, what's a millenarian?
It has something to do with the millennium. Let's go. 1596 to 1680. A Scot was born in Holland, student of the Wulan a Seminary in Leiden, was a pastor in Germany. He then began a lifelong campaign to reunite all the invalid evangelical churches in Europe and travel all over from Sweden to Poland, Germany, Holland, Switzerland, France, England. He lived for a while in Amsterdam and was one of the Cromwell's chief agents of the continent. All right, those are, that's, that's his, uh, his accolades. He was in, in England when presented with Thorogood's text, he immediately put it in context of some provid, provid, or providential data he had learned from the Jews in Holland or the Hebrews in Holland, especially from Manasseh in Israel. The lost tribes of Israel, listen up, and then we're going to get it. We're going to tackle this doc with a dragonfly perspective, but please pay attention because we ain't dropped this since 2016. The lost tribes of Israel would appear just before the millennium. I said to be a millenarian has something to do with the millennium. Something to do with finding you, which Dury which was sure would occur in 1655. So we got a 1655 date. Let's see what else we got. He had heard from a Jewish jeweler in the hog that some of the lost tribes had been located east of the Holy Land in Persia or in Afghanistan. He had heard from the most learned Jewish writer of the time, his friend and co-worker Manasseh in Israel, that a Portuguese Moreno seller or explorer, listen up, Antonio de Montezinos, had encountered a Hebrew tribe in the Andes Mountains. You know how that uh, city of gold opens up? High up in the Andes. <laughs> the search for the cities of gold, right? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. They in the promised land looking for the gold, my naga, the milk and the honey, my naga. He knew that Manasseh had had Montezinos, who came to Amsterdam in 1650 or 44, gave his account before a notary. So Dory wrote Manasseh for a copy of Montezinos' report. He was duly sent it. Then Dory and his fellow millenarians, so these are fellow millenarians. All these people think the world is going to end in 16, what, 55? Somebody else says 1666. All right, so somewhere around that. And his fellow millenarian, Nate, Nathaniel Holmes, wrote Manasseh to see if he made out of this what they did, namely that the Indians, namely that the Indians, Namely, that the Indians were or are the lost tribes. Come on, man. The correspondence printed in the preface to Thorogood's book shows Manasseh being most cautious, unconvinced until he is finally willing to say, that the group encountered by Montezinos could be part of a lost tribe. <laughs> While the rest of the inhabitants of the Americas were migrants from Asia. Well, we in Asia, right? We know we in Asia, right? We got the maps. Let's go. <laughs> Holmes immediately pointed out that this meant that the climax of world history was at hand. Because the lost tribes were beginning to reappear, my naga. What is finding you? What does finding Preston John? This is why we keep going back to this. What does this have to do with them and their prophecies? What does finding Preston John have to do with the fountain, <laughs> with the waters, man, with the holy city?
What's it got to do with you? I mean, let's be real. What's it got to do with you? Why are you here? Why are you listening to this? Why are you vibrating to this? I told you, don't come over here for information. I ain't here to give you information. We ain't here to share information. We're here to share vibration. You can't approach a Preston John investigation with information, man. You got to approach it with vibration. You got to be nine above the barrier. Hijack free. You got to come in the cold. All these things got to happen simultaneously for you to get to where we're at. In the Preston John investigation, which is our signature series right here on YouTube. And we got all of it, you know what I'm saying, that's going to go into book form, you know, real soon. I mean, this is what I plan on doing, man, when I, you know, take a step back from from, from, from dropping the drop here, you know what I'm saying? But we have to establish it here, finish what we start here so that we can, you know, correlate it all and be able to have it, you know, so that we can pass it on in our generations as a, a cumulative and, you know what I'm saying, as a culmination, man. As a coronation, man, of the Naga and the drop that, you know, Hawa has been, you know, leading us to the water, man. So everything about your search, everything about them finding your con, man, right? Comes down to this. We're getting into the psychology behind it all so he pointed out that this meant that the climax of world history was at hand because the lost tribes were beginning to reappear Manasseh was asked what was the Hebrew view about the lost tribes and their reappearance rather than write another letter Manasseh wrote his famous, most famous work, The Hope of Israel, which appeared in 1650 in Spanish, Latin, Hebrew, and English. <coughs> and in Dutch. <coughs> and a few years later, the English edition dedicated to the Revolutionary Parliament of England was translated by a friend of John Milton's, the wide-eyed millenarian Moses Wall. So another millenarian popping up. <clears throat> Shalak, man. You know, you already know, man. I've been talking, man, and vibing <laughs> just to get to this point, man. It's all right. So this translation appears in editions in 1650, 1651, and 1652. Okay. <laughs> all right. I mean, this time period is ultra important, man. The last two editions included an appendix in which Wall exchanged views with a reader and emphasized the millenarian importance of his work and that it should help bring about the conversion of the Hebrew. So he found a way. Let's back it up. Let's back it up. This translation, what translation? Let's go back. We're talking the hope of Israel written by Manasseh. All right. The English edition dedicated to the Revolutionary Parliament of England was translated by a friend of John Milton's, a wide-eyed millenary Moses Wall. This translation appears in addition in the editions in 1650 all right, through 1652. The last two editions include an appendix in which Wall exchanged views with the reader and emphasized the millenarian importance of his work. Because this millenarian framework is really... You know what I mean? What went into the spell to do what? To put you to sleep, to do what? To convert the Jews, right? To convert the Nagas, to convert the Hebrew Israelites right here in America. Or you can say uh, to convert, namely that the Indians were the lost tribe. So to convert the Indians is to convert the Hebrew. Right. The conversion of the Jew is the conversion of the Indian. In India superior, that is. So finding you. The reappearance. <clears throat> so 
He said, man, what about this reappearance? It's all about this reappearance. So if you always had the drop, you always, you know, took center stage. But when they found you here, it became a reappearance to them. I don't know if they ever found you before. <clears throat> I don't know why you were so lost to them. But apparently finding you was a reappearance. A reappearance. <laughs> And this was such a big deal for you to reappear that they created a whole religion around it or Scientology around it called the millenarians or millenarianism, whatever. You know what I mean? Where they said the world is ending if these people don't reappear. And that's that's what we're going to touch on more in this John Ruiz doc. Remember, Columbus is looking for the what? The Grand Khan. He's looking for you. Same time period. Millenarians thought the world was going to end about 10 years after they stopped looking. So <laughs> they barely got to their checkpoint before the virus was about to be exterminated, man. Then they got an extra boost, an extra, extra life. That's why Christ of old for Christopher is their Christ. He led them to the promised land. This Jesus that they made up did not lead anybody anywhere. He just promised that I'm going to come back and, you know, through my blood, you get salvation. Everyone's clinging to this Yahweh Shai. They're clinging to the Christ. They're forgetting what the search is all about. They're forgetting Hosea 3 and 5. Hey, they've even forgotten Hawa. They've even forgotten the ancient love song. But uh, we, I think we got a copy of the Hope of Israel. I'm pretty sure we got a copy of that in Drop Library. Go check it out. I think we got a copy of the uh, Manasseh in Israel in his world in the Drop Library. Ty Battle, the record keeper. She got the drop. Yeah, I just want you to just to really... You know, hone in on the reappearance aspect of this all, man. Holmes immediately pointed out that this meant that the climax of world history was at hand. <clears throat> right? So, because the Hebrews were beginning to reappear, the lost tribes, right? So, your reappearance or your discovery <laughs> for these hijacks is what the climax of world history that means nothing else what's the climax of a movie what's the climax of a movie what's the climax of a book what's the climax of a conversation con it's the highest point it's the it's the, it's the point that you got the most out of right so this world history is getting, you're getting the most out of it when the Nagas start to reappear. <laughs> That's amazing, man. Because these millenarians, they thought the world was ending unless you reappear. Manasseh was asked, what was the Hebrew view about the tribes and their reappearance. So he wrote this whole diatribe, man, called the Hope of Israel, man. And emphasized the millenarian importance of his work and that it should help bring about the conversion of the Jews. And they're still trying to figure this out. <laughs> Check this out. It says, in a preface, Winslow said that there are two great questions which have troubled ancient and modern writers and men of the greatest depth and ability that they have tried to resolve. One, what became of the ten tribes of Israel? Two, where did the American Indians come from?
Those are the two greatest questions that they got. My naga is what happened to the Hebrews and where did these Indian nagas come from? These are the learned scholars, right? This is the writers and men of the greatest depth and ability. And they're trying to figure out two main questions. Behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, they're searching for them. They're searching for them. What became of the 10 tribes of Israel or the 12 tribes of Israel? And because they thought they had to drop on the other two, right? Because the Jews claim that they're this and, you know, Judah and this and Benjamin. So, oh, the other 10 are lost. Now, what became of the Nagas, right? What became of the Khans? And where did these Amara Khans come from? A godly minister of this city wrote to Rabbi Ben Israel to find out if he knew what became of the 10 tribes. According to Winslow, Manasseh's answer was that they were certainly exported or transported to America. <laughs> so he didn't say, oh, they're from America. He said, oh, well, they were transported here. At least he admitted that they're here, right? And these can't be no Jews we're talking about today, right? No hijack city, own Hollywood, yada, 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 right? Because we're talking about the indigenous Indians are being called the Jews. <laughs> so we're just talking about the copper color races found here by the European. For Winslow, it was wondrous that Hawa had opened the hearts of the Indians to the gospel. Oh, he thought the creator opened the hearts of the Nagas to the spell. Well, maybe the creator did. Maybe the creator put a spirit of stupor on us. Is that what it says in Isaiah? Did the creator say he put a spirit of stupor on us? That we'll become so lost that we're going to know I am Hawa. That Hawa exists, right? We're going to know that Hawa exists because that's how stupid we're going to get. And then when we wake back up, we're going to really know that Hawaii exists, right? For Winslow, it was wondrous that the creator had opened the hearts of the Naga, the Indians, to the spell, to the gospel. Just when so many eminent divines expect the conversion of the Jews. Oh, right on time. Right on time for us to conquer your land and to get in where we fit in and have our little empire for a few hundred years. Remember, the two greatest questions are what? I'm talking the, the learned men of, of the greatest depth and ability what became of the 10 tribes or what became of the Israelites and where did the Amaru Khans come from? So you are all up in the mix. They can't get around you. <laughs> they can't get around you, man. This is a great drop. Go ahead and dig on it. I think we're ready now. So let's jump in to the main course. And, you know, we'll start back where we where we left off at. This piece right here. You got to keep going back to now that you got a dragonfly perspective of the con of the grand con that Columbus is looking for. Of Preston John that everybody's searching for. Of the correlation between that and King David, Wang Khan, of the Karya to the Kar Katai, the connection with Cathay and China and Katai, and that you're in Kalelus, you're in America. So when we go back to this, this is the beginning 
only the beginning of the book of collection of these authorities, sayings, opinions, prophecies. We're going to get on the seven prophecies again concerning the need to seize, to vanquish, right? To vanquish, to seize what the Papa Bulls say, to search out, vanquish the holy city and Mount Zion. You see why Columbus was looking for the Grand Khan. He wasn't lost. He's looking for the Grand Khan in Greater India. He ain't lost. Not if he's looking for the Grand Khan in Greater India. He's right on time. He's right on point. He's right where he need to be. I mean, Columbus is right where he need to be. It's just that we're lost, right? We're the lost tribes, right? So if we're lost, you can tell us anything. But the conversion of the Indies is synonymous with the Holy City. And now we can see how this connects with the Karakata. So let's get it back. This is the introduction. Columbus's quadricentio, centennial <laughs> in the following words. And let's see how we can connect all the millenary in connection, right? With this Pope Leo situation and all that, you know what I mean? So now the four centuries have sped since the Ligurian first, under God's guidance, touched shores. Unknown beyond the Atlantic, the whole world is eager. <laughs> Touch shores unknown beyond the Atlantic, my not. Right. Unknown means they didn't know it existed. So they can't call it new in the relative sense unless they're just saying it's new to them they can't even date this world they have two questions uh, uh where did these indians come from that means they don't know nothing about you they don't know nothing about you the whole world is eager to celebrate the memory of the event and glorify its author who's that columbus christ of over nor could a worthy reason be found where through zeal should be kindled for the exploit is in itself the highest and grandest which any age has ever seen accomplished by man and he who achieved it for the greatness of his mind and heart can be compared to few in history of humanity this is pope leo the eighth or excuse me the 13th in 1892 celebrating columbus He's calling him the greatest <laughs> for the greatest of his mind and heart. He can't be compared to but a few in history. For the exploit in itself, the highest and grandest. Because they're looking for the grand con. Columbus accomplished the grandest the grandest event, even though he died in a jail cell, <laughs> he accomplished to them. He's their savior. I need you to see this clearly. He is Christ. I need you to see this clearly. <laughs> Man. Man. All right. So he can be compared to but few in history, but his toil, another world. By his toil, another world, by his toil, a whole nother world emerged from the unsearched bosom of the ocean. <laughs> but we got Nagas here today that just got found saying, nope, ain't nothing to see here, boss. Ain't no foundation stones over here, boss. Nothing to see. We got to take a got to take a plane to the to the Middle East, man. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> By his toil, another world emerged. Man. <laughs> Come on, man. You're in another world, man. So when you talk Jerusalem relative to Hebrews, you got to talk about this world that these Hebrews exist in. That these Hebrews are really, you know what I'm saying, you know, staking their claim and from and connected to all these other ancient lands right here in these vortexes because they took the toil to find you 
and through this toil emerged from the unsearched bosom of the ocean hundreds of thousands of mortals from a state of blindness from a state of blindness man didn't we just read in Manasseh and Israel that they're trying to figure out how to convert you from a state of blindness, right? Oh, because they said the creator opened your hearts to the gospel, right? Samuel Seawall said they brought you an excellent new tune and took away your ancient love song. They're trying to figure out how they're going to convert you. And what they say here. If the Indians were Jews. If these are the Israelites. An enormous missionary effort would be needed, right? To bring you out of the blindness, right? Hmm. Or to put you into perpetual servitude by capturing your mind into this new tomb. So you're looking for a new savior and have a new flow. <laughs> oh, Gentiles this, oh, my enemies that. That's a whole new tomb for the real Joshua. If the Indians were Jews, an enormous missionary effort would be needed. So on behalf of the New England Missionary Society, a volume was written by Norfolk preacher Thomas Thurgood called Jews in America. This was dedicated to Charles I, but his overthrow delayed the publication of the book. The job of writing a preface to it was given to John Dury, perhaps the most active millenarian, right? Because they thought the world was in it, right? So they were suspecting something radically different was going on in the environments, man. Because these Christians were baptizing Indians who were Jews. Judah, right? These Christians were baptizing Hebrews. Huh? And if they're baptizing Hebrews, man, if we got to baptize Hebrew Israelites, right? That's why they're trying to convert the Mongol, right? The greats, right? The great ones. That's why they keep trying to convert the greats. And what a gang is kind of say, nah, man, <laughs> tell your Pope to submit to me. Wasn't they weren't dealing with this situation, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They were they were slaying Islam on one side, slaying these Christians on another side. Yeah, you know I mean they're all you know what I'm saying paying tribute to the Grand Khan. But then you know what I mean as as this situation is unfolding, as the fall of the Khans is happening, as the fall of the Nagas is happening, they took an opportunity in your blindness. To creep up. Let's go. In your blindness, they put together a missionary effort with the hope, with the hope <laughs> of conversion. An enormous missionary effort will be needed. Enormous means enormous, by Naga. So now that we can look back on time, do we see the enormity? Of the missionary effort that was used to convert you or to soften you, to emasculate you, to make you afraid. I mean, it's been a it's been a couple hundred years in the making. At least. So when it comes to Columbus, this is who they're worshiping. They'll never get rid of the real Columbus Day because <laughs> you're just talking about JC. That's, that's, that's all it is to it. Because 
ain't nothing this Jesus can do better than what Columbus did. Why? I mean, even Pope, even the Pope is telling you, Pope Leo the 13th, for his exploit, Columbus is in itself the highest and grandest which any age has ever seen accomplished by man. Anaga, he said, any age. <laughs> There's nothing greater than what Colombo has done for them, for the hijack in any age. There's nothing greater. For the greatness of his mind and heart, he's slaughtering you, but he has a good heart. Can be compared to few in the history of humanity. He's doing inhumane shit, but he's, you know, He's topping off humanity, right? By his toil, another world, right? Worlds beyond the poles. They just found you in another world. Emerged from the unseen bosom of the ocean. Hundreds of thousands of mortals have, from a state of blindness, been raised to the common level of the human race. Reclaimed. Or they reappeared, right? From savagery to gentleness and humanity. Can you believe this shit? They found you as a savage. Hmm. And greatest of all by the acquisition of those blessings of which JC is the author. Oh, we're just talking Columbus. They have recalled from destruction. <laughs> they recalled from destruction to eternal life. I'm sorry. You're the millenarian. You're the one who thinks the world is in it. You're the one who's, whose world is being destroyed, virus. In 1990, anticipating the Columbus Quintincentio, Quintincentennial, Quintincentennial, damn, 1992, the governing board of National Council of Churches of Cristo in the USA adopted a very different tone. Well, let's have it. In its resolution entitled A Faithful Response to the 500th Anniversary of the Arrival of Christopher Columbus, 1992. 1992 celebrates celebrations of the 500th anniversary of the arrival of Christopher Columbus in the Quote unquote, new world will be held for the descendants of the survivors of the subsequent invasion, genocide, slavery. Uh oh, someone's getting the tone. <laughs> someone's doing a course correction. Ecocide, which means they killed the account, they killed the ecosystem down there, <laughs> and exploitations of the wealth of the land. A celebration is not an appropriate observation of its anniversary. The church, with few exceptions, accompanied and legitimatized the conquest, exploitation, theological justifications for destroying native religious beliefs while forcing conversions to European forms of Christianity, demanding a submission from the newly converted, the Hebrew, right? We just got that out of Manasseh in Israel that facilitated their total conquest and exploitation. Therefore, it is appropriate for the church to reflect on its role in the history, tra historical tragedy, and in pursuing a healing process to move forward in our witness for justice and peace, healing process. You know what our healing process is? You know what our healing process is? Utter destruction of the, of the illusion. Utter destruction of the illusion. While this is surely not the place to reopen the Pandora's box of the controversy over the Columbus Quentin Centennial, it may well be solitary at the outset to recall both the non-innocence and the non-neutrality of biblical interpretation and scholarship. It has often been said that the conquistadors arrived in the Americas with the sword in one hand and the Bible in the other. Much attention has been devoted, and rightly, to how the colonizers wielded the sword, yet comparatively little energy has been invested in considering the ways in which the Bible was understood and employed 
in the colonial undertaking. On the other hand, the Bible furnished the, su the substance of colonial evangelization efforts in the sermons and catechetical, catechetical, catechetical materials directed to the colonized by the colonizers. All right, man, you get it. Big fancy words. Catechetical, man. I mean, I ain't going to... You dig on it. <laughs> At the same time, the Bible played a crucial role among the colonizers themselves as they sought to frame their enterprise in terms of the worldview shaped in large measure by their understanding of the Bible. Right. So I say, what does King James got to play in you falling asleep? What does Charles have to play with you falling asleep? What does the more and more war got to do? What does Genghis Khan's descendants got to do with it? While several important studies address the religious dimensions of the conquest of the Americas, scholars of the religion of religion have devoted relatively little attention to this period in the history of biblical interpretation or to the place of the Bible in shaping the Spanish colonial enterprise in the Americas. And back to this, right among the earliest and most fascinating witnesses to the latter is a manuscript of 84 folios dated between September 13, 1501, March 23, 1505, 1502, and now preserved in the Biblioteca Columbina in Sevilla. It begins, this is the beginning of the book or collection of authoritates, sayings, opinions, and prophecies concerning the need to recover the Holy City and Mount Zion, and the discovery and conversion of the islands of the Indies and of all peoples and nations. For Isabella and Ferdinand are Spanish rulers. This manuscript, commonly known as El Libro de la Profecias, the Book of Prophecies, was compiled by Christopher Columbus himself in collaboration with Gaspar Coricio a Carthusian monk of Italian origin who belonged to the monastery of Santa Maria, uh-oh, uh-oh, de la Cuevas in Sevilla, uh-oh, we're talking their uh, necromancy, right? The manuscript begins with Goricios. Hold on, let me get it from here, let me get it from here. Let me reload this joint. So, you know, you see how this holy city situation really comes to life. When you bring in the full spectrum of the events surrounding it, you got to put it all in context, man. And ain't no greater context you can put anything in other than tribal. And for you, we're talking about the Americans, man. The cons, man. All right, let's get it from here. Uh, what's this? What's this? So this manuscript begins with Goricio's transcript of the September 13, 1501 letter in which Columbus explains the project and asked for his assistance. And he says, Reverend and very devoted father, when I came here to, they put Granada. So they added this in, but we know we're talking pomegranate, man, pomegranate. I began to collect in the book excerpts from authoritative sources that seem to me to refer to Jerusalem. When I came here, he got the drop on Yerushalayim. I planned to review them later and to arrange them appropriately. Then I began to... I became involved in my other activities, man, slaughter, man, and did not have time to proceed with my work, nor do I now. I'm still slaughtering the Naga, but so I'm sending you this book, man, <laughs> so you can look at it. Perhaps your soul will motivate you to continue the project of our Lord, right? Their blessed Savior, according to Samuel Seawall and the selling of Joseph, love to let us find the truth has altered the measure of your ancient love song. To continue the project of our Lord will guide you to to genuine auctoric taste. <laughs> so they want all the drop. And this is what we're going to connect right now to the big Judah drop. Love to the bro. And, you know, what's all this uh, influx, right? Because after this, right, they came over here first. 
uh, you know what I'm saying, love to the bro. They only had, what, like 1,200 manuscripts or something like that. We're going to get it. And then suddenly they just got halls and mouths of mouths of libraries. I mean, millions of man. That, I mean, you know what I mean? So hundreds of thousands, that millions of manuscripts, man. So they got, they, they started getting the influx. Uh, somebody left a comment that said, did they get all this drop from these different caves in the Grand Canyon, man? The Grand Canyon. We got to do a whole series on the Grand Canyon like never before, man. You know what I mean? So look forward to that. After Presser John 60, we're going to get into the Grand Con, man, like we never. We're going to search in the Grand Con like we never had before. Because how did they get all these documents? What's this got to do with Qumran, right? The Dead Sea Scrolls in Qumran, right? We're talking to Qum. Get that Presser John drop. We're talking Daniel al Qum, right? So he came here, right? <laughs> when I came here, I got all these books. I got all these excerpts from all these authoritative sources referring to Jerusalem. And then he passes it on, right, to Gar to, to Garatio and says, hey, man, maybe you'll find some use for it. Now, Garatio also includes his March 23rd, 1502 reply to Columbus in his manuscript. My Lord, you will see in my handwriting the few things that I have added and inserted, I submit everything up to your approval of your intelligence and your prudent judgment. The contributions of Goricio are somewhat more substantial than his modesty suggests. Uh -huh. So he did more than meets the eye. And they are identified by scholars of the manuscript by Goricio's distinctive handwriting. The manuscript proper is a collective of biblical texts, ancient and medieval commentaries, fragments of Spanish poetry, and occasional comments by Columbus himself. Its intended, its intended addressees, as the incipit indicates, were Ferdinand and Isabella, before whom Columbus hoped that the book of prophecies would justify his imperiled project for the work took shape after Columbus after Columbus's far from glorious return from his third voyage back and then he gets you know back to I began to collect these books from authoritative service which seems to refer to Jerusalem you know what I mean going back into that and you know what I mean and we're gonna uh you know what I'm saying get some more drop in a minute man from you know this book of prophecies but right quick I just want to take a little you know not even a sidestep, man, but really a step forward, man, into the great work of the bro, uh, Big Judah. And then we're going to come back and get some of this seven prophecy drop for the dismount. You know, we're just digging on this great drop by uh, John Ruiz out of St. John University, man. And let's just belly flop into some words. Let's get a few minutes of this great work from the bro, Big Judah, man. And we are surfing the wave, chatterbox, how... What it do, man? You know what I'm saying? How you really? I know how you feeling, but how you really? Do you feel like you got a dragonfly perspective as you see this different than you did a few years ago? Maybe you're a new wave surfer and you're like, whoa, man. You know what I'm saying? I got to surf the wave, which is all good because the wave is you. You are the water. Let's go. Get the a little drop. while ago, a uh, video from our... Uh con drop came up on my feed and it went perfectly with a video that I was going to come up with that I already had planned. So I'm going to leave the, um, the link to the, uh, to the video in the description box, but it's, uh, shows how like years ago he brought out this information talking about how Columbus came here looking for uh, Mount Zion here in the Americas and the Holy city. Most I, um, you know, enlightened me to that yeah, yeah, a few years later on. This shows how the Most High has been working throughout our nation with uh, different brothers and sisters and in order to bring this information out piece by piece. We are, uh, many of us all have our pieces to the puzzle. And the Most High uses us at opportune times in order to bring those pieces together. I don't believe just one person has all of the information. I believe the Most High gives us all you know, our bits of information, our ways of helping, our ways of supporting this movement, 
in order for the Most High to be able to give the blessings that he's already set up for each of us. It was a really, it's a really short video, really good video that Kondra put out and um, kind of just let you, let, you know, let you know how he's putting every, everything together. The lies that we've been told are so numerous and so in depth and so sinister that it takes many of us in order to be able to bring this information together. God. Now, a part that I'm going to add to this is the fact that the Vatican lets you know uh, what it has hidden in the secret archives. Might not tell you exactly what is uh, hidden in there, but you can figure it out by some of the things that they say in some of these books. Some of the books that we get, you know, it might only have a couple of nuggets here and there. And we have to be, you know, mindful that the, and that the Holy Spirit be sent to guide us to those certain parts of the puzzle. You can get an opportunity right now to see how this is all going to work out right now in this one book. I was going to let you know that at the beginning, these, these Vatican archives had very little to no information. Very little to no uh, writings in them. And then all of a sudden, it seems there was an explosion of information. And I'm sure you're going to be able to figure out how slick they are, how they hide some of this information, <clears throat> you know, and how they, they're slick with how, um, you know, where they got this information from. Check this out. Today, we're going to be looking at this uh, National Geographic inside the Vatican. Okay, we're going to go ahead and go up to around page 100, I think about 143. And we're just going to look here at the, uh, at the bottom. Actually, let's look at here. Today's signs requesting uh, no talking keeps the Sistine Chapel relatively quiet, but it is still among the most visited sites in Rome. As many as 20,000 people file through it in a single day. The whole room, some 132 by 140 by 44 feet and taller than it is wide, remains the most famous single jewel of the Vatican collections. The art, books, artifacts, and documents that make up the collection are displayed throughout the Vatican chapels, galleries, and hallways, and in 14 museums, the secret archives, and the Vatican Library. Now check this part out. Many scholars call the 15th century humanist Pope Nicholas V the true founder of the Vatican Library. <clears throat> so this is around the four, in the 1400s, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. He loved manuscripts and collected hundreds of them, some dating from medieval times when Nicholas died in 1455. An inventory, an inventory listed some 1,200 manuscripts 800 in Latin, 400 in Greek. So take a, take a look at that inventory list. 1,200 manuscripts. 1,200 pieces of paper, 1,200 books. Um, that was pretty much the Vatican Library <clears throat> in the 1500s, and, well, in the 1400s. Not very many books. Not a whole lot of information. kind of crazy right so now let's take a look at what they're gonna talk about what's in the vatican what kind of things are hidden there let's take a look at let's see trying to find that real quick here it is uh first paragraph there at the top the vatican library is one of the world's greatest repositories of medieval and renaissance manuscripts and Inconabula, books printed before 1501. Hmm. That's kind of that's kind of weird, but let's continue here. The Vatican was the world's intellectual switchboard at that time. How could it be a, a world switchboard and you know when you're only dealing with like twelve hundred manuscripts? That means that they didn't have very much information, right? So uh, let's see. Notes Dr. Declan Murphy of the US Library of Congress. It was the first institution to put knowledge at the service of government. Okay. We got 15th century sketches of now vanished Roman ruins, early maps and manuscripts, even Greek and Roman coins. 
okay, and whimsical medieval caricature, caricatures can all be found in the collection. And scholars are permitted to handle um, handle the rare books in a well-lighted reading room. We want people to feel welcome here, explains Father Leonard Boyle, the library's director. He was once a reader here himself. Now you got Pope Paul V, founded the Vatican Archives in 1612. Though their primary purpose is um, as a repository for the popes, records and files, scholars are admitted by special permission for the, this decanting of history. As one cleric has called it, here is an abdication document of Queen Christina of Sweden, signed by her lords in 1654. Now, hold on, let's just stop right there. We got a lot of things talking about the 1500s, the 1600s, and things like that. As you can tell, you don't need 50 plus miles of, um, of shelving that they have now if you're only looking at the vast majority of medieval, you know, medieval papers and things like that. The main thing I wanted to take a look at is this word right here, en cunabula. Now, oh, well, let's just take a look at the definition. All right. So, in Cunabula, an early printed book, especially one printed before 1501. <laughs> well, we know in 1455, they had their little information about what they had in there, around about right here. 1400s, 1500s, as many scholars call the 15th century humanist Paul, uh, Pope Nicholas V, the true founder of the Vatican Library. So he's, this guy's the one that founded it, right? He loved manuscripts and collected hundreds of them. So he collected hundreds of them because he was such a great collector, I guess. Some dating from medieval times. Wow, that was such a long time ago. <laughs> when Nicholas died in 1455. An inventory listed some 1,200 manuscripts, 800 in Latin, 400 in Greek. So from and around 1455, if you look at the inventory list, there's only 1,200 manuscripts. Not very many. So we already know that even before this, many of these people didn't read that much, didn't write that much, so didn't record that much. So 1,200, I guess, for them sounds like a huge amount of information. <laughs> but what happened after 1492, people? They, uh, the Most High let them come over here. And then all of a sudden, it seems like all of a sudden the Vatican libraries just grew like crazy. They're going to try to make it sound like, oh, well, look, this is what these are kind of things that we got into it. We got Queen Christina of Sweden. We got some, some documents signed by her, signed by her lords in 1654 and authenticated by 306 seals. This still doesn't explain how you got 50 plus miles right, right. of books down there and artifacts all of a sudden. So because in 1455, you barely had 1200. I mean, remember. I mean, the bro does great work, man. Make sure you're in the classroom. A big Judy. You know what I mean? Steady surfing the wave, man. Remember, man. Back to this doc, right? I mean, what are we dealing with when they came over here? <laughs> over here. What did, just, what did we just read? Reverend, when I came over here, we're talking America, we're talking Pomegranata, I began to collect in the book excerpts from authoritative sources that seemed to me to refer to Jerusalem. I planned to review them later to arrange them appropriately. Then I became involved in my other activities and did not have time to proceed with my work, nor do I now. And so I'm sending this book to you so that you can look at it. Perhaps your soul will motivate you to continue the project of our Lord. <laughs> and our Lord will guide you to genuine authorities. The search for text should be continued in the Bible and the commentary is often useful and should be used for clarification. The search for text should be continued, right? And just like Big Judah just said, man, how you go from 1,200 docs 
to just what do you say 50 miles whatever it is now full of just stuff man like you know so they seem to have this big influx right when i came here <laughs> i began to collect <laughs> these excerpts right so you know this vatican got all these pieces of stuff from these authoritative cert sources that refer to jerusalem man. when i came here Let's get a couple more minutes of Big Judah, and then we're going to surf the wave with Balcony Surfer Trap, man. As promised, man, you know, just for a great dismount. I appreciate everybody in the chat, chat, chatterbox, and everybody just flowing, man, listening in and getting this Drizna from Big Judah. 100 manuscripts. You couldn't have that much more information going on. So there must have been some kind of an explosion of information that all of a sudden gets hidden in the Vatican archives. Something then that you're just getting information, well, wouldn't it kind of make sense that if you come over to a new world that you haven't been to, and you supposedly burn all this information, which we know you didn't because you brought the um, calendar over to, you took the calendar over to Europe, and you ended up uh, finally getting your calendar straight based off the information you got here. So how many other things did you try to get straight by going through our records? Mm. And then hiding the fact that uh, you took our you took our records back to your lands and reverse engineered things and made it seem like it was you that came up with it. Mm. But right here, you're telling on yourself. Mm. Right here, you're saying you had 1,200 manuscripts around 15, 1455. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so in you know thousands of years, talking about the Greeks and the Romans, you only had 1,200 manuscripts. Then all of a sudden. After 1492, after Cortez came over here, Bang. all of a sudden, then from then from the, the 1500s until now, you ball. You have 50 plus miles of information right. hidden in your archives. Bang! And again, we're talking Pope Nicholas V, man. Love the big Judah, man. Putting in great work. Make sure you're in the classroom. Yeah, you know Just click the red button. You know, I'm already in there. Make sure you get in there. We're talking Pope Nicholas V, which brings us all the way back. Love to the brother Lex, man. I always get the brother a high for this, man. This is this powerful bull, man, which ain't no, which ain't no baloney. You know what I mean? When you are putting it together with your discovery or invasion in context, context with these newfound books and this Vatican situation, right? Pope Nicholas V. Now, this is three years before his death in 1555, according to the bro. So, Pope Nicholas V issued Papal Bull Doom Night versus 18th June. It authorized Alfonso V to Portugal, right? Here you got a Portuguese monument. This is in Portugal. This is in Portugal. Put it in perspective. They're searching. Search out. Search out. Search out. Let's go. Let's go. Along with the sanctifying, <laughs> the seizure of non-Christian lands. So you can't be in the mind of a Christian man when they're looking for non-Christian lands. It encouraged the enslavement of native Nagas, Mongols, Magi, non-Christian peoples in Africa and America which is Northwest Africa, according to the Amexa map, right? So, quote, we weighing all in singular the premises with due meditation and nothing, noting that since we had formally, by other letters of ours, granted, among other things, free and ample faculty to the aforesaid King Alfonso to do what? Invade, to do what? Search out. Search out. They're searching for you. I can't make this shit up, man. Come on, man. It's a victory lap. I told y'all we having a victory lap right now. It's a victory lap party. You know what I mean? 
<laughs> raise your glass of of the primary man. Everybody got a glass of primary man. Did Yosef pass that around? Everybody get it. Did everybody get that glass of the primary water? Okay, all right. So raise your glass of primary mem. Let's toast to the memory. Let's toast to the memory, man. Do you remember who you are? Let's toast to the memory, man. To invade, search, right? Capture, vanquish, subdue all Saracens. Ka. This is a Saracen's head, and for some reason, it looks just like us. Oh, the word Saracen was used in early centuries as of the Roman Empire describing an Arab tribe from the Sinai Desert. Come on, man. <laughs> Not when you're just talking the lost tribes of Israel, man. Not when you're just talking the lost tribes of Israel, man. Now we're just talking Cathay, or excuse me, Cathness. <laughs> the Rus, man, with wisdom. Wisdom is the conqueror of fortune. It's all about that mama. It's all about mama. It's all about the town. So when they talk Saracen, this is you, my nag. All right. To invade, search out, capture, vanquish all Saracens and who they call pagans. We call them, you know what I'm saying, utter hijacks. We call them heathen. They call us pagan, okay? So whatsoever and other enemies of their Christ. Wheresoever place and their kingdoms. And their kingdoms, right? Dukedoms, principalities, dominions, possessions, and all movable and, immo <laughs> and immovable goods whatsoever held and possessed by them, and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. Because you're blind right now. They got to convert these Indians. They got to find a way to convert the Indians. How are we going to baptize these Christians? We're baptizing and converting Indians who were Jews, who are Hebrews. And if the Indians are Hebrews, an enormous mission, enormous, enormous missionary effort would be needed to convert the Nagas to Christianity or to convert the Khans to Christianity when the Khans are the greats, are the Prester Johns, are the Magi, are the Moguls or the Mongols, or the great ones are the Mangis, right? <laughs> Even on this map, you got the Mangi. Mangi. You can also look up Manku or Mangu Khan. So we got another Mangu Khan situation. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> We're just talking Catholics. We're just talking the Saracen. Perpetual slavery to the Saracen, right? And to apply it appropriate to himself and his successors. So they take everything of ours and they apply to themselves and all their children. Our kingdoms. Our dukedoms. Our counties. Our principalities. Our dominions. Our possessions. Our goods. And they convert them to his or her or their use and profit and they have uh secured this right <laughs> by his authority justly they say and lawfully they say doth possess these islands these lands these harbors these seas 
and they do right belong and pertain to King Alfonso and his children. And you got the rest. We're just talking Nicholas V. Like the bro Big Judah was just talking Nicholas V. And now we're going to do a dismount. And the seven prophecies. I said the seven prophecies, man. The seven types of prophecies. And get this link, man. I, I love to read every page. But you got the drop. <laughs> you got the drop. I think we've done our due diligence. I'm just, I'm just glad we found the link so we can always come back to it now. We can always come back to it now. Yeah, I'm just, you know, scanning through this with you. Surfing the wave, man. I'm just showing you, you know, just showing you some of these pages, showing you some of this drop. And uh, if you ain't got the link yet, hit me up. Music at 432, the drop, man. How important was Isaiah's prophecy? Right? Isaiah's prophecy of new heavens and new earth is a source Columbus cites repeatedly. We find it in his letter, Don Juana. Or Don John uh, de la Torre, and in his preamble letter to his book of prophecies, in both instances, he joins John the Divine to Isaiah as prophets of his own mission and new world enterprise. Who's John the Divine? <laughs> right? We connected John the Baptist with Preston John, or we're just talking a slick way of putting in that they're searching for Preston John. The connection he forges between those prophetic voices and his project is clearly typical or typological and figurative of his procedure is in keeping with his hermeneutic procedures of medieval tradition. So they're dealing with Hermes, man. We're dealing with Thoth. Uh-oh. We have an idea of how Licit such connections are and how pervasive the ideological force authorizing them from the fact that Father Ptolemy de las Casas commented on Columbus's invocation of Isaiah in his letter on the third voice states simply that since Isaiah was a prophet, he could well have been prophesying the discovery of the new world. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Was Isaiah prophesying the discovery of the new world? When the creator tells us that we'll be put into a spirit of stupor. Oh, Columbus was clearly laboring under the. The edges of perfectly listed and canonically legitimate criteria. It is curious, though, given the apocalyptic urgency of Columbus's argument that the Book of Prophecies only cites the Apocalypse of John three times, referring to Revelations 1, 6, 16, and a list of biblical texts about the islands of the sea. <laughs> so this is where they're getting it. 
islands of the sea, huh? Hey, maybe. While in his presence form, the Book of Prophecies appears to be somewhat haphazard collection of materials drawn from many sources, the exegetical principles that shape the materials and the comments by Columbus clearly reflect the mainstream late medieval practices of biblical interpretation. Several additions to the manuscript by Garicio reinforced this after the letter from Columbus to Garicio and Garicio's reply and after Garicio's superscription, superscription, we find first a quotation on the fourfold interpretation of scripture taken from the Summa Angelica under the rubric exposition that is 1499 Summa Angelica de Casibus. Uh, hey, this is reinforced by a quotation of the well-known trope on the fourfold interpretation of scripture attributed to John Gerson. All right. It says the literal teaches the facts allegory what you should believe, the moral you should believe, the ana, anagog, anagogical <laughs> where you are going. The equally familiar illustration of the fourfold meaning of scripture from the 18, 1482 rationale divertorum or fissurorum follows. The fourfold interpretation, four, fourfold interpretation of holy scripture is clearly implicit in the word Jerusalem. In a historical sense, it is an earthly city to which pilgrims travel. It's going to be a great dismount right here, though. Because where do pilgrims go, right? The whole time we've been told pilgrims came to America. Oh, Thanksgiving is all about the pilgrims. Thanksgiving is all about pilgrims, man. And we eat and we feast as a nation, right? What do these pilgrims got to do with Jerusalem? Allegorically, in any case, the church and the world, tropologically, Jerusalem is the soul of every believer. Analogically, the word means the heavenly Jerusalem, the celestial fatherland and kingdom. What's this got to do with the land of the presbyter, Johannes? What does this earthly city have to do with where the pilgrims came, man? Right, the Muslims got their hajj and pilgrims been coming here, right? <laughs> I mean, this evidence confirms the judgment of Avalos that Columbus was conservative in his exegetical principles following early medieval exegetical traditions without much deviation. Let's get it from here, man. Let's just, let's just keep it going. I'm about to get into these book of prophecies. I'm just, you know, scrolling through a couple of these pages in case you wanted to, you know, take any screenshots or something. I don't know, man. But let's go. Let's take it from here. Later, also in Garicio's hand, the book of prophecies includes a lengthy quotation from Isidore's Etymologie on the seven different kinds of prophecies, man. I'm going to let, you know, Balcony Surfer Drop take us out on this one. But there are seven kinds of prophecies, all right? The first, there are seven different kinds of prophecies. The first is ecstasy. Have you ever thought of ecstasy as being a form of prophecy, my naga? A transport of the mind, for example, when Peter, oh, that's the hijack, but this is an example, in a state of mental confusion, saw the vessel containing various animals being lowered from heaven. All right, so... <laughs> He was in a state of ecstasy or mental confusion, and therefore it's prophecy. All right, well, let's go. Second kind is a vision. Some people see visions, right? I saw the Lord seated on a lofty throne. I say it's six and one. Got the dragon saying, holy, holy, hawa, right? The third is a dream. Some people got the dreams. Jacob sleep and saw a ladder leading to heaven. Genesis 28, the fourth kind of prophecy is a cloud, man. Remember the cloud. What's a cloud? <laughs> When Hawa spoke to Moshe and to Job after his misfortune, the fifth is a voice from heaven, like the one that spoke to Abraham, do not lay a hand on that boy. All right. The sixth is received from a parable, through a parable, Solomon in Proverbs, Balaam, and Balaam when he was commissioned by Balak in Numbers 22. 
through 24. The seventh is permeation or permeation by the Holy Spirit experienced by nearly all the prophets. Permeation by the Ruach. So, you know, wave surfer drop. I'm going to go deeper on that. But, you know, this is only a 20 some page document. You can, you know, take your time and really dig on, you know, you know, each and every part of this, man. I'm just grateful that we found it. And I wanted to, you know, premiere this live with y'all and, and just be in the classroom with y'all and just enjoy the flow with y'all. You know, that's taking the trip down memory lane. A lot of y'all left great comments and I appreciate that. You know what I'm saying? Y'all drop, you know, just y'all took me back, you know what I'm saying, to, to memory lane with your comments. You know what I'm saying? And um just to remember how special each each wave is that we've had so far. Like we say this is the fourth wave and the balcony was like the first wave, you know what I'm saying? But it's all one thing, it's all one wave and you know, everybody's you know what I'm saying? Been uh, just contributing, you know, along the way, man. And, man, y'all been dropping them comments, man. Um, and I read them, you know, like I'm doing now <laughs> in real time. I need this info. Anybody need it, man, hit me up. Music at 432, the drop. Let's go, man. Love to No Slack Zone, Terrell James, Ralph Worley. What it do, man? Always surfing the wave in real time. Always surfing the wave in real time, man. Hoodoo voodoo. <laughs> what it do? He said, imagine saying Christopher Columbus was lost looking for India the whole time. He knew exactly where he was going. The past 300 years should be called the hijack age. <laughs> yeah, man. Love to the fan, man. Ralph Worley said, body blow. We're just surfing the wave. War Chief, Red Lion, word up, brother. Hawaii, Texas in the house. I need that Drizna, man. Texas in the building. Hey, Hob, Dath, Dath, Bakar, Vin Lad, what it do? Coolio, Cali, active, man. Talking about that Ben Judah. Big Judah. Love to Sean Chris. Check out Renee Gwenam on the language of the birds title PDF. All right, all right. Definitely, man. Definitely, man. Got to get that drop. Thanks for the speedy get back with the link. I've been trying to be speedy with my get backs on these links. So hopefully you got the drop. I appreciate you, Fred. And I mean, y'all just been, you know, dropping. You know what I mean? Just it's always a trip down memory lane, man, when we surfed away with the family. A lot of people, man, I was listening back then. As a matter of fact, you turned me on the legs. Will, I mean, everybody's putting each other wrong. You know what I'm saying? And that's what we got to see. Vivica Gresham, a hey, man, dropping that Baruch 4, 23. Get it going. You are so on it, brother. All praise the most high. High vibes, what it do, man. Lavish stoning, what it do. So, all right, man, since we're taking a trip uh, down memory lane, we're going to let uh, Wave Surfer, uh, Balcony Surfer drop, what it do. He going to take us on home with these seven kinds of prophecies and y'all that have been surfing the wave since the balcony i really miss this setup man it was such a pure water flow and we always uh you know all praise a while find another one and another one and another one and another one and we needed to be here exactly what we what 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 we were you know what i'm saying and we need to be here now exactly what we are so hey man you want to uh you want my old rhymes, man? Buy my old album, man. You know, go back to 2016, man. You want the, you want the new, uh, new flow that connects to us today in 2020, man. Hit up Con Job 2020. You know what I mean? But from King Job 2016 to Con Job 2020, we never had to switch up and we never had to change up. We put the creator first, then we put the creator first. Now we connected directly to the creator. No hijacks allowed. Then in 2016 off the balcony and we connect directly to Hawaii now. Nothing has come in between us and our creator. And that's what I'm proud of, man. I'm proud of all y'all for that. So let's surf the wave, man. Hey, hi to the drop, drop, chatter, chat to chat, chatter. That's what I call you because you got the drop. And you, and you in the chatter box dropping that drop. Let's get this dismount with balcony surfer drop. In 2016, Book of Prophecies, seven kinds of prophecies. Get the drop. Let's go. Good stuff, man.
Here's some good stuff, man. Let go. Okay. Off the balcony, though. specifically talks about uh, vision and prophecy and how they broke it down. Somebody might have found it already. Right in front of me the whole time. Bang. Y'all saw it the whole time. Y'all saw it the whole time. Y'all yeah, just, man. Why y'all, tell me? why y'all tell drop, man? All right, so we, let's just keep. It was a, it was the next paragraph. Yeah, all right, come on, come on. All right, so there are. This is according to. This is later also in Garci Garcio's hand. So this is Garcio is his his sidekick. The Book of Prophecies includes a lengthy quotation from. Isidore's etymology on the seven different kinds of prophecy. So here's, um, you know what I'm saying, just some of the etym etymological breakdown of prophecy. Now, this is what they were, you know, using to substantiate, you know, X, Y, Z. You know what I'm saying? So when they were saying prophecy, it wasn't necessarily saying like one type of prophecy, like one, one guy is talking about, I can tell you the future. When Columbus is saying that I'm a prophet, you know, he's breaking down the etymological, you know, form. So here's from Isidore's etymology, and this is what uh, he's saying that Garcia um, includes lengthy quotation from. So there are seven kinds of prophecy. So seven kinds of prophecy. The first is uh, there are seven, uh, quote, there are seven different kinds of prophecy. The first is ecstasy. A transportation of the mind. All right, so I'm just reading. Let's get the babies out the bathwater. Seven different kinds of prophecy. Listen up. The first is ecstasy, a transportation of the mind. For example, when Peter, in a state of mental confusion, saw a vessel containing various animals being lowered from heaven in Acts. Right. The second kind is a vision, exemplified by the words of Isaiah. I saw the Lord seated on a lofty throne. Isaiah 6. The third is a dream. For example, Jacob sleeping saw a ladder leading to heaven in Genesis 28. The fourth kind of prophecy occurs in a cloud. For example, when God spoke to Moses and to Job after his misfortune in Exodus 19 and Job 38. Uh, the fifth is a voice from heaven, like the one that spoke to Abraham saying, Do not lay a hand on that boy in Genesis 22 and to Saul, Saul on the highway in Acts. The sixth is received through a parable, for example, Solomon in Proverbs and, and Balaam uh, when he was commissioned by Balak in Numbers 22. The seventh kind of prophecy is permeation by the Holy Spirit experienced by nearly all the prophets. Now, there's no scripture behind this seventh type of prophecy, and that's the hijack. I mean, all the other ones at least has some type of scripture to back it up. This one, it says the seventh kind of prophecy is permeated by the Holy Spirit. Bang. Experienced by nearly all the prophets. And then they move on. So they give you no example of this Holy Spirit, you know, except I guess if you want to go to Acts or something. But I find, I find that interesting for the seventh prophecy. Now, immediately afterwards, we find a further quotation from Isidore, Isidore, distinguishing among three kinds of vision. So we have seven kinds of prophecy, according to them. And three different types of vision. So remember, vision is one of, of the prophecies, right? First, uh, you got ecstasy, transportation of the mind. That's one. You got the second kind is a vision, all right? Exemplified by the words in Isaiah. Ah, so now we're still with Isaiah, right? Columbus loves Isaiah. So he sees himself as a visionary, right? So let's break down vision. There are three kinds of vision. All right, this is how he's going to claim he's a prophet, right? Um, others have said that there are three kinds of vision. The first is received by means of the eyes of the body, etc. Another is received through the mind 
when we form mental images of those things that the body experiences, etc. The third kind of vision involves neither physical sensation nor any part of the mind in which images of physical things are conceived, but comes through an intuitive understanding of truth. I'll read that again. The third kind of vision involves neither physical sensation nor any part of the mind in which images of physical things are conceived, but comes through an intuitive understanding of truth and so forth in the same selection. So I guess all of us that have an intuitive understanding of truth can say that we have vision and therefore we can say that we're all prophets. Hey, all right, so that was his, 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 his jumbo. All right. And lastly, I'll, I'll read this and we got to keep going on the basis of Columbus's own claims to divine illumination and, and inspiration. It is hard to avoid the impression that this quotation serves both to provide an appropriate her, hermeneutic, hermeneutic, hermeneutical, hermeneutical, hermeneutical. Thoth, man. Let's find the truth, man. Let's let us know what that is. Thoth. Hermeneutical framework for uh, the interpretation of texts marshaled in the Book of Prophecies, and also to validate the role of Columbus himself, both as an interpreter of biblical prophecy and as a chosen instrument of its fulfillment through its journey. So this was used to validate it, right? As he claimed in his letter to Don Juana, God made me the messenger of the new heaven and the new earth, mm. of which he spoke through St. John in the Apocalypse after having spoken of it through Isaiah. And he showed me that location. Columbus reads and announces the fulfillment of scripture by traveling. So he's fulfilling the scripture by traveling. So I just wanted to get that seven different type of prophecies three different visions he's talking about now when we talk about 1492 we got to bring it back and we got to understand all right got to understand what was happening around them what did they first attack or what did they first do first right they expelled the jews out of spain Right. They went to war against the Moors, all this kind of stuff right over there. So that was the first situation. So this uh, site, Real History uh, WW, has uh, some dope. I'm just going to scroll down and we, we're going to see some images of uh, some of the stuff going on in Europe at that time. Take this down. <laughs> <laughs> balcony surf check Let's out go. Europe at that time and some images of the moors um, you know everything that was going on and you know a lot of stuff gets jumped up in titles moors jews this that that you know what i'm saying clearly we're going case by case with it but you know i'm being very loose with the titles right now being very loose uh right. uh wave surfer drop <laughs> balcony surfer because you know now we can really see with a dragon pop perspective it wasn't such like, oh, we're going to war against the Moors, per se. You know what I mean? It was like, you know, it's a more and more war, and the Moors are doing treaties, and you know what I mean? So it ain't like, oh, it's the whites going against all blacks. No, no, no. That's the illusion. It's more and more to this day. And I don't think back then we had a grasp on how how, uh, how much, you know what I'm saying, this Psalms 83 really play. You know, now we can see, oh, it's been a more and more war, and it's still a more and more war. All right, so here's this example of these were, you know, some of the palaces and stuff like that, you know, around from, what, the 1100s and early stuff like that. Uh, this is how, you know, our melanated family was already rocking in Europe. And again, the kings of Spain, which you'll find out, you know, these kings, right? These, you know, all, you know, King James, Charles, all this stuff like that. These are dark people. But we're going to see pictures of that. So these are all, you know, homes of, of our Moorish family, right? Our melanated family. All right, so a lot of uh, our brothers you know, know who this is. Rudolph Ernst. Ernst, 
1854. So this is the 1800s. So we're skipping around a little bit, but this is 1854, man. <laughs> All right. And this, this brother's just chilling in 1854. Man, that mm. date is correct. You're in 2016. Now check out his swag and his pedigree. You tell him, man, you know, put down your weapon. See what happens. <laughs> Try to tell this man what balling is. Say, balling, I want Rick Ross to come up and tell this guy what balling <laughs> And show him some money. Show him a bunch of dollars. Money clip. Pull out houses of gold. <laughs> houses of gold. <laughs> All right, let's go. Oh, man. All right, I mean, you know, hey. It's all We're happening. In Spain, right? It's all happening, you know, man. Rocking and rocking. It's all happening, they, man. They, they, they love their Turkish women. Right? I mean, of course. That's what it said. <laughs> yeah, Turkish women. Turkish. All right. This is his brother. He's an executioner. Chopping them down. Damn. All right. It's the same brother, I think, Rudolf uh, Ernst. Do it his thing. Yeah. I mean, the swag, the pedigree is, 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 is phenomenal. <laughs> it's phenomenal swag. All right. Mm. I mean, you can read it, see what's going on. So you already see what they was into, right? <laughs> so now that we see clearly. I'm more presenting some a bird. Bird dance. And you see who was their slaves, right? Now that we see clearly. And by the time they get unleashed over here and try to force their narrative on us, now you see the trickery, the trickery in the background. Now we see the confusion in the background. This dude is just, you know, getting, you know, just chilling. That's how we used to chill back then. Culture, culture. <laughs> Sharpening the blade. All right. Now, you got conquest, right? The Moors are being conquered. This is a painting. So, on this conqueror chopping off the head of a Moor brother in Spain. So, they went to war. It says, St. James, the greater conqueror, the Moor, Giovanni, Batista, Tiepolo, 1749. So, by 1749, this is what's happening, right? Now, what's happening in America in 1749? Well, you research, like, let us find the truth. The first, what? <laughs> American uh, Cherokee Wars and all this kind of stuff. So, 17, wait, wait, 1776 is when they set up shop here. And this is 1779? Hmm. 1749? Come on, people. They say they found you as savages, though. 20, 30 years earlier, and then they got their Declaration of Independence here. Do you see the correlation? They went to war there and here simultaneously. And really the correlation is that a lot of our people, when you talk about the Eber and the Eberu, right, and the Iberia and the Iberia Peninsula, you're talking about the sons and daughters of Eber. So you got a lot of Eberus or Hebrews right there. You know what I mean? But, of course, you got still the more and more war situation happening. You know what I mean? But they're all falling under this Eberu Hebrew title. Now, they can only take advantage of it later once we are already at war with each other. You see what I'm saying? Whether that's there or here, all this is following the Papal Bull that we just read, 1452. Here comes Columbus, 1492. And on and on we go. With the iconoclasm, renaissance, the birth of what? And who's still behind the scenes? They went to war, war against the Saracens and pagans there and the Saracens and pagans here. Whatever they want to call enemies of their Christ. For their Christ, their God of war, their Jesus, they went to war against everybody. <coughs> At least on paper. Right. At least on paper. Because we don't really know what's happening behind the scene. The surrender to the 
than not. All right, you can read up on that. Let's keep going. I just want to just pay attention to the images. What does this one say? The Capulation of Granada. Muhammad the Seventh confronts Ferdinand and Isabella. This is a painting by Pradele de Ortiz, 1882. This painting goes back to 1882. The white folks you see is Ferdinand and Isabella. And then the brother on the horse is Muhammad. Hey. Look like they was making a treaty. Right. Look like they were making a treaty to me. Confrontation. Let's go. Looks like the treaties of pieces and friendships around here. This don't look like no war. <laughs> this don't look like no war. Looks like a friendly confrontation, huh? I just want you to pay attention to the images. This is what's going on. All right. Nah, nah. What's that? Let's belly flop. Let's belly flop. Let's belly flop. Have hijacked even him now, right? But <laughs> you're going to wake up into a tribal war. You're going to see Psalms 83 is for real. They formed a confederacy against you. Be careful with the energy of your so-called brother and know that if he's not talking about order, he ain't talking about shit. Maybe we did know about the more and more war in 2016. And that's street smarts. That ain't separate is holy. You're gonna have to separate to 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 find out what's going on. You're gonna have to distance and, and separate to come back together. That's the ebb and flow you need. But separate into order and see where everybody's coming from. Study, show it to prove, study everything we're bringing out, study all these documents. Don't take nobody's word for it, period. Mm -hmm. All right, so let me get into some more hijacks and some other stuff. So we got a few more minutes, y'all. Let's see if we can do this. Again, here's a close-up image. You can see the facial features. I mean, you know, you go get your eyes on the King of Spain hijacking. <laughs> Bang. Just like that. Just like that. Hey, man, shout out, man, to the balcony surf, man. Everybody that's been surfing the wave since the balcony days. Our investigation continues, man, um, against all odds. You know what I mean? We had so much, so many, you know, that tried to distract us, you know what I'm saying, from reaching our goals, man, from staying focused around here. And yet here we are. We got a lot to be proud of. You've been surfing away for these for these three hours, man. Live and full of fay. A hop to you. Much love to you. Appreciate the energy. Appreciate you being here, you know, just because you are hungry. Cause when we wake up after being in some uh in some chamber, some sleep chamber. We're all hungry, man. We're we're starving for that real primary water. And this is the water that the Khan, that Khan Dawi, you know what I mean? That Hosea 3 and 5, man, that when we wake up, we seek our Hawa and David. That's who's going to lead us on this earthly plane to the water. That's the frequency within us that leads us to the water. You can see it in different, you know, on different levels and different octaves through the seven kinds of prophecies or the three types of visions. But when Columbus is looking for the Grand Khan, and you see right here, Charles Quinto, King Charles V, hijacking this lineage of Inca, or, you know, you could flip the script. You could look at it like he's really continuing the lineage. If this is all the family of Batu Khan, I mean, some would say that these Inca, you know, might have already been the family of Batu Khan or Genghis Khan right here in America, right? So, you know, maybe he's continuing. Maybe he's just, you know, putting it in a whole nother framework or 
he's cutting it off. Bang. <laughs> you know, either way, it's a more on more war. Now, more just means great. I don't get offended if you call me a more. You're just calling me great. You're just calling me a, a mongo, right? <laughs> I don't get offended if you call me a mongo, man. You're just calling me great. You're just calling me a magi, right? Or a great one. Who are the great ones? Who are the great ones, man? Who are the tribes? And what happened to the lost tribes? Well, they're baptizing and converting the Indians who were Jews, right? <laughs> so if the Indians are the lost tribes, then an enormous missionary effort would be needed. An enormous missionary effort would be needed. But what did they do? They came in and what? Invaded. Searched, captured, and subdued. And we ain't stopped searching. Allah wah for the water. All praise our frame and our shaper for the perspective that cuts through all layers of the static and we start taking that walk down memory lane you know what i'm saying <laughs> and realizing and recognizing what this holy city business has always been about man from from day one from numero uno the holy city from day one has only and i mean only been about you and this is what we recognize. And this is what we realize. So, Ahab for surfing the wave in this documentation out the Biblioteca Columbina, Sevilla. We connected it to a lot of drop and really did a real comprehensive review, three hour review. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Drop Nation Wave Surfer style, you know what I mean? Classic Wave Surfer, Balcony Surfer style. And I wanted to do that for my Balcony Surfers because. It's a good uh, feeling, man, to see where we started and to know that it's pure water and to go back years later, you know, and to always have that. And, uh, you know, my next step is, you know, writing, you know, um, or, or putting this in book form. You know, writing is one of my first passions and I've always done it, man. Um, and now I have a purpose for it. So I look forward to it. This is the beginning <laughs> of the collection of authorities. Concerning the need to recover the holy city and Mount Zion. While we discover and convert these islands of the Indies, man. Allah. That we can reappear for ourselves. Because if their whole thing is about reappearing. You know, if, if their whole situation is about you reappearing. Holmes immediately pointed out that this meant that the climax of world history was at hand because the lost tribes were beginning to reappear. If this whole situation is about you reappearing, my naga, your reappearance, then how much more important is it for you to reappear for yourself? And this is where we'll leave off until the next one. If it's this important, if it's the climax of world history for you to reappear to the hijack who's searching for you, how much more important is it you? Is it for you to reappear for you? They're getting a whole bonus of what, 400 years for finding you because now their millenarium, their, their their millennium can it be extended through the Christ of Ophir. But how much more is your life extended when you reappear to you? <laughs> I think when we reappear to us, it's an eternal flow. <laughs> 
I think when we reappear to us, we have found the drop in the fountain. We found the water. When we reappear, we have found the eternal fountain of you. All praise are created every single day. Connect directly and nothing else. Keep on surfing the wave. Chatterbox, I appreciate all, all the inspiration in the chat, all the inspiration, you know, um, and all the comments, man, and all the drop that you dropping, wherever you dropping it, I'm getting it, I'm receiving it, and it's a major charge up for the tribe. So this is our time, this is our victory lap, and we already won, because we are natural by law, man, a hop to the real Shalom to the Shabbat. Continue to serve the way. Allah, the Wada, drop nation.